Stephanie Redcard. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Good afternoon, welcome to the one Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, to the One Africa Youth Forum Conference today. Um, we are going to have an awesome time today. Um, this is our second conference. We had one last year, and this is going to be so awesome. We have so many awesome speakers this afternoon, and I am going to... So, Prince, is Barbara ready? Is Barbara on the, on the platform? Yes, I can. She's joining in now. Okay, she joined it. Okay, I'm going to hand over quickly to Barbara Conito. That is our Ghana representative. So each representative in each country from Africa is going to introduce themselves and tell them a little bit about themselves. So we have a representative from each country in Africa. So we're going to start to kick off from Ghana. And Barbara, I'm going to hand over to you now to um, please just introduce yourself. And when you finish, please hand over to the next speaker. I think she's just trying to connect now. We'll just give her yeah. a few minutes. Yeah. Barbara is still trying to come. Yeah. Um, yeah think, she's, she's on now. Hi, Barbara. Hi. If you can unmute for me, please. Um, if you can put on your camera, that'd be great. Okay. 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 Thank, thank you Barbara, so much. Thank you. I'm Barbara from West Africa, Ghana. On behalf of Af African Forum, I wish to bring you warm greetings. Coordinators from West Africa are happy to be part of this forum, where the best influential personalities within and outside the continent have gathered under one roof to share their immense theoretical and practical knowledge with us. It is our singular expectation that the aim of the forum will be achieved as well as putting our shoulders to the hill towards Africa's transformation. Thank you and may God and Allah bless us all. Thank you so much, um, Barbara, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, please, our next representative. Zineb, is she here with us? Zineb, Zineb, are you ready? Hello, hello everyone. Uh, could you, could, is it possible to put your camera on so we can see you? Is it possible? Oh, no, please. No, okay, that's fine, go no, ahead. Sorry. The platform, that's fine. Go ahead, the platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Zim Arabat. I am country coordinator of One Africa Forum from Morocco. I want to welcome today's conference speakers and audience on behalf of One Africa Forum coordinators of the, the region of North Africa, a region with a glorious history and a promising future. The countries of Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Mauritania share the same culture, the same language, and the same history. Young North Africans have many struggles but they also have high hopes to achieve progress while remaining loyal to their roots and identity. From the coastlines of the Mediterranean, the vast Sahara Desert, and the heights of the Atlas Mountains, we are sending you our gratitude and appreciation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zainab. Thank you so much. Uh, can we go to our next representative, please? Hi, everybody, and welcome to this global conference. My name is Ria Bezwe. I come to you from South Africa. I am not the South African country coordinator, but I will be giving a welcome address on um, her behalf. How do we speak about One Africa Forum without mentioning who we are? So we are a movement of organized bodies and individuals with a vested interest in Africa's unity, development, and absolute independence anchored on dignity, peace, and freedom. Having been part of One Africa Forum in South Africa, I've been part of establishing the Noble Club and the GVV campaign that has been running. And I'm sure that, you know, as we continue to collaborate, as we continue in these sessions, there's much more that we can do together with one another. I'm looking forward to us collaborating, sharing ideas, and coming from this thing, uh, coming from this conference with ways of how we can move forward together and not just individually in our separate countries. I'm looking 
looking forward to also hearing from the speakers with what they have to share. And I hope each and every one of us has got a pen and a paper that you're ready to take notes and that you're ready to network. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, that was excellent. Thank you so much. We'll go to our next representative, please, if you're ready. Hi, Prince. Hi. Next representative, are they ready? Are they on the, are they on the platform? Yeah, please check. Mr. Walter, if he's around. Uh, Mr. Walter, please, if you can unmute and put your camera on, we're just waiting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, One Africa Forum, wherever you're joining from. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I look forward to having a great program. From Middle East, uh, once again, my name is Walter, coordinator for Middle East One Africa Forum. I'll just say a few words uh, in line with our uh, mission and vision. Um, ideology never dies. While its inventor may die, it lives century till it is achieved. Even when personality and fame passes on or fades, the ideology remains. However, we must attempt to birth into existence our ideology. We must architect our ideology into the future so our children's children will learn from it. In the words of Kwame Krumah, action without thought is empty. Thought without actions is blind. Africa's history has been written by foreigners, our colonial masters. It has been written in a way that it tends to blindfold our potentials. These narratives we have learned as kids in the past. We have read the history. We have lived and experienced part of the history. Now we are the present that will determine the story to be told in the future. Thus, we must rewrite the African narrative and the Africa history. Dear Africans, in the words of Bosse Ogulu, Mama Bona, you were African before you were anything else. So wherever you are in the world, please identify, represent positively as Africans. Show your potentials to the world. And of course, say good things about Africa. Once again, you're welcome to One Africa Forum Youth Conference 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walter, that was great. Thank you so much, please. If the next representative, um, we've had East, um who's the next representative please uh prince we have your mute sorry prince you're on mute all right sorry about that thank you um it should be from the eu East, yes. Our okay. oh, East representative, please, if you're there, if you can unmute, please, and put your camera on. Um, I think I think the next should be would be you, Barbara, from the EU, from UK. My, myself. <laughs> I introduced my, I introduced myself from the beginning. <laughs> I'm Helen. I am the um, the coordinator, the representative from the UK. Um, I'm quite new to the. Um, the One Africa Forum, but I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to this conference and what we're going to do together. I'm looking to, you know, really push for the youth to be empowered and, you know, working with so many great people on this platform. So I'm really looking forward to after, you know, obviously networking with a lot of you and seeing how we can actually push and, you know, make an impact with our youth, starting with our youth and leadership in Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, Prince, you're on mute. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. And um, I want to welcome you all again. And I really appreciate all that you have done. Uh, to everyone who is in the room, we say hello and welcome to the Global Youth Conference hosted by One African Forum in South Africa. We want to say a very big thank you to everyone who has played uh, 
um, yeah, different roles and actually supported us morally uh, in terms of their yeah, advice and all form of support that they have given to ensure that these progr this program uh, is a success. I want to also encourage everyone that as we gather here, we should not just have it in mind that we are gathering to meet people, but we should also have at the back of our mind that opportunity to harness the uh, immense potential that uh, Africa has in store for everyone. I want to encourage you all to not to take this opportunity, get your pen ready and ensure that every information that will be given out here today will be used and used efficiently. And ladies and gentlemen, I would also encourage you and advise you that the people who are in this conference today, our speakers caught across professionals, experts from various sectors. They are uh, entrepreneurs. We also have investors who are all on this platform. They are here to listen. They are here to network. They are here to collaborate with you. And please, please, and please take uh, full advantage of this opportunity. In addition, I also want to say a very big thank you to everyone. And also uh, in South Africa, uh, the month of August is Women's Month. And that also goes to play a very huge role to uh, how women have actually supported us in this uh, organization. And let us put it forward there that One African Forum is an organization that supports, respects, and uh, encourage the, the uh, participation of women in all platform and all organizations. We encourage human and uh, human rights and also equality. As a matter of fact, as said earlier by the coordinator from Southern Africa, uh, we have launched a project that actually seeks to achieve gender equality in Africa. And we, our campaign is also running and fighting against gender-based violence. And with this, I want to say a very big thank you to so many women who have played very immense role and influential role in ensuring that this program is a success. Um, and we, as in celebration of the women here, want to say a very big thank you. Uh, Helen, thank you for joining us. And we also want to say, uh, recognize uh, uh, the, uh, the presence of one of our speakers who, will also, who has also been very, very influential and living up to her name, the networker. Thank you very much, Cornelia Henschel. She is here and she has been very, very, very instrumental in ensuring that this program is a success. I can assure you that many of the people that are coming today very many of them, Networker has been very instrumental. From the moment she caught the vision, she actually did ride with it. And I want to say thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Sonia Silva. She has been very instrumental as well from the background. And, uh, and so many, many names I will mention, but we don't have enough time. And I'm also not going to forget to say a very big thank you to Ms. Rehabetre Pasha, who has been uh, immense help support and guidance to the organization. She's been a very huge resource to the organization. I want to say thank you. One African Forum will respect women and we are, we are an inclusive organization. So ladies and gentlemen, from wherever you're joining from anywhere in the world, uh, if you're in Africa, especially, I would like you to please connect with the country coordinator in your country. Find a One African Forum coordinator in your country, support them, engage with them and run project with them. There are a lot of things going on the ground and there are a lot of things we cannot do until we have you in our midst. So please find out Richard Ross, we will have all our contact details, find out who the country coordinator is and connect with them and work and grow the work of One African Forum and ultimately Africa. Let me quickly emphasize this, that this program today as the Global Youth Conference is being hosted in Africa this year. And that means that we must take advantage as Africans to ensure that every benefit that this uh, organization, this event and this conference uh, produces actually is well used and well uh, efficiently utilized in Africa. Next year, we are not sure what uh, which continent will be hosting the Global Youth Conference. So ladies and gentlemen, is that not the best thing for us to do when such an opportunity is provided to us in Africa? We take advantage. The theme of this conference is optimal transforming Africa through effective sectors collaboration. And that means that this conference will have our vision and our aim is after this conference, we want to drive every economy, we want to drive every sector of the economy, I beg your pardon, and also every individual to who actually is a stakeholder uh, in the economy to optimum. That when we look back at today, we'll see that post COVID, 
we have actually come adjusted to the new normal and also thrive through it all. So I want to say welcome again and not take it much of your time. We have a lot to do. I want to say welcome, welcome, and welcome. Just get your pen ready. If there's someone you know who is still not here, please get them on before the room is filled up. Otherwise, they will have to join on Facebook. So please, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Uh, I am Prince Edosi Erahon. Uh, and uh, leader of One African Forum. Thank you very much and God bless you. Over to you, brother. Um, Helen. Good afternoon. Good. Thank you so much, Prince. Helen, you're on mute. We can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Sorry, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Hi. Um, we just had a question come through in the chat. Um, somebody asked, um, how can we, please, I am, or what, sorry, they want to know how they can connect to their, rep re their, re their representative in each country. Um, okay, for this one is from Ghana. So the Ghana representative is Barbara. Barbara, um, you can connect with Barbara. She's also on the platform. Maybe what we can do is... Um, we can maybe get a list of the names of each okay. each um, representative, and then we can connect you to that person. So the representative for Ghana is Barbara, and she's on the platform. Barbara, I don't know if you can put your 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 um, camera on so we can see you. Is that possible? Hi, Barbara. If you're still on the platform. Okay. Is she on the platform? Let me just check. Barbara, uh, you're on mute, Barbara. Okay, maybe she's away from her um, desk at the moment. Okay, should we go to the Ni Nigerian representative um, from for One Africa? Um, if you're on the platform, please, can you unmute and put on your camera? And please, um, can we hear if we can hear from you? Thank you. Can I quickly just jump in there? Um, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, I'm List of those here, the coordinator from Nigeria is not in this room right now. Um, okay. So, guys, guys, if you want to uh, know the coordinators from the various countries, you're welcome to send us an email. You can reply to the very email that you received during uh, uh, after you registered. Reply to the very email and just mention your name and your country and what you would like us uh, to connect, who you'd like us to connect you with. So, if it's your country coordinator, just let us know and we'll reply you. Uh, in in less than 48 hours, you know? So thank you, thank you all very much. And uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, is the um, musician available now? Is he on the platform, Prince? Um, we, are, we actually have a special rendition, but I don't know if uh, Conscious is in the house. We, we have a special rendition from Conscious. He's not in the house now, I can't find him. So we'll have to just move to the uh, next session. Um, Cornelia, is Conscious in? I can't see him on the platform. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we, we can, can hear you yes. now. It's yeah, I'm just trying to organize conscious in the background. He is with us in Clubhouse, but um, he's, uh, he has to download Zoom. So I'm just busy in the background to sort him out, okay? If it doesn't work, then he's going to have to go live in uh, Clubhouse and then live here if all the devices are on. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, that's fine. And... Um, so over to you, Helen. Okay, um, anybody else that needs to um, to introduce themselves? Any other representative? Have we missed anybody out, Prince? Um, we have had, that is on the and, um, platform. Uh, and also just a quick one. I know I see I see a couple of people raising their hands. Um, we will not be able to take everybody and uh, you know recognize everybody to, as, to introduce themselves. But uh, if you, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please just raise your hands and we will, you know, we will uh, recognize you for now, but then we'll not be able to take as many people, but it's very important that we get to know who, we are, who is in the group, who is here and so on and so forth. So please, if you just raise your hands and um, okay, I see Zachariah. Oh, hi, Zachariah. I see Zachariah um, and um, okay. Your hand is up, Mr. Simon. So yes, uh, over to you, uh, Helen. 
Okay, if we start off with Mr. Simon, if you'd like to unmute and just introduce, introduce yourself to the platform, please. Thank you. Simon, your hand is up. Hi, okay. Simon. So, you... oh, Thank you. Good, good morning. Hello. Hello. I'm Simon from uh, Nigeria. Um, I like I like to uh, cooperate with this, and I like to know our uh, coordinates also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. We had another hand up, please. If you'd like to introduce yourself and unmute, please. Yes, I think he's is that Ozazi. Ozazi, please. Yeah, your hands up, please. Can you? Um, would you like to unmute and introduce yourself? I can see your hand up. If you'd like to unmute and if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Uh, Comrade, yes, I can see you. If you can introduce yourself, you can introduce uh, yourself, please. please. Thank you. Yes, let's, use, let's use let's use the app, the platform, the uh, function on the app. Just raise your hand on the app so that everyone can see. You. So yes, um, Evelyn, who did you recognize? Okay. Okay, you you are muted. Introduce yourself, please, and then I'll. Okay. I don't think he can hear me. I don't. Okay. I think. Let me go to the next person. Okay. Sh Emmanuel. Emmanuel, would you like to introduce yourself? You put your hand up. If you'd like to unmute yes. and introduce yourself, please. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening from Uganda. This is Ekanga Emmanuel. Um, a newly appointed country coordinator for Uganda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. That's great. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Evans, Evans, um, please, you've got your hand up. Please, if you've already spoken, can you please put your hand down so we know who has spoken and who has not? Evans, if you... Evans, please, if you'd like yeah. to unmute and introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Okay, my name is Evans, a participant from Ghana. Hello. Uh, we can hear you. Hello. Carry on. Yeah, yeah. My name is Evans. Evans, a participant from Ghana. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Carry on. Yeah. We can hear you, Evans. Yeah, yeah. I uh, just joined. I'm so glad to be part of this team. I'm from Ghana. Hello. Thank you so much, Evans. That's great. Right. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank You're welcome. you so much. Lovely. You're welcome. welcome. Um, welcome. And Fabrice, Fabrice, please, if you're on the platform, we can see your hand is up. If you can, um, if you can, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Please, if you're on the platform and you're not speaking, can you please mute? Thank you, All right. Sir. Hello. Good afternoon. Yeah, good, good afternoon, afternoon you everybody. Have the floor? Yes, you have. You can have the floor, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Fabrice Mali. i joining you from Togo. And it's a pleasure to be with you. I know this event is going to be something <laughs> great. And I look forward to learning new things. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Lovely. Please, if you have, have you, if you have spoken. All right, good afternoon. Um, is that Mr. Um, is that Sir, Sir Ike? Sir Ike, if you're on the platform, please, can you unmute and introduce yourself, please? Sir Ike. Hi. Thank Hi, you. Hi, this, this is Barbara, uh, coordinator for I'm getting problem with my, my phone. That is why I'm using this. Uh, I am glad to, to be part of this conference. This is my first time and being the coordinator for Ghana. I'm expecting to learn more. So I think all of us should contribute, uh, involve ourselves so that at the end of the day, what we want to achieve, we will achieve. Thank you very much, I'm grateful. Thank you so much, Barbara, that's, that's excellent. Thank you so much. 
Have we got anybody else? Please, if you have spoken, if you have, if you have introduced yourself already and your hand is up, please, can you put your hand down for me? So, okay, let me just lower the hands of the people I've spoken. Okay, Sir so Ike. Okay, okay. We have, I think the name is Ebikake, is, is, is Os Osasis Ebikake. You had your hand up before. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Would you like to introduce yourself? You can speak. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we've been, yeah, carry on. Yeah, yes, good morning. Good morning, good everybody. Afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me, Ellen? Yes, we can hear you. Thank yes, you afternoon. so much. Yes, my, yes my, my, my name is Komid Oya Sibukake. Komid Oya Sibukake. Um, I'm from Nigeria, and I'm standing for the largest, largest youth group in Nigeria, which is uh, the Nigeria Youth Council. Thank you very much. That is excellent. Thank you. And you are you are welcome to the platform. Thank you so much. Um, if we have any other, like we have Shola. Shola, you have already spoken. Let me just put your hand down. Thank you. Please, um, no, I am here. I think it is network or okay. from the panel over there. Please help us. This is Shola Kenya. I have not spoken. Yeah, let's recognize them. Let's recognize Mr. Shola. <laughs> Sorry, Prince, you okay. saying something. Yeah, I just raised my hand. I've not spoken. And your name is? Sorry. Ahead? Okay. Yes, I'm your name Shola is? Kenny. I'm Shola Kenny. Okay, Shola Kenny. Yes, go ahead, please. Before. So, go ahead, please. The yeah. platform is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello to everyone. Um, Shola Kenny is my name. I'm the convener for Tech Expo Africa in Nigeria. And um, I could say that uh, we are partners in progress. Uh, amazing initiative you have here too. And I look forward to a great event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shulake. Thank you. And you're welcome to the platform. Thank you. We have one more hand up. Is Issa Thayam. Issa, would you like to unmute and introduce yourself? You're welcome to the platform. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you. I am Issa Jam. Just, I am Senegalese, and I join you from Cameroon. My English is not too good, but I am trying to hear you. My finger, you will hear my English. Yeah. Yes, Hello? Do you, hear, do you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. I am Issa Jam. I'm from Senegal, but I join you from Cameroon. My English is not good, but I will try to understand every intervention here in this uh, meeting. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you so much, Issa. Thank you for joining the platform. You are welcome. Thank you. Okay, Any thank more you. hands up? Let me check. Della, Della, would you like to um, introduce yourself, please? The platform is yours. Mm. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Della from Ghana. I was introduced by Auntie Barbara and on the platform to see how best we can strengthen the group in Ghana and West Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Della. Thank you. You are welcome to the platform. Um, thank you. Della, I'll just put your hand down. If we have anybody else who'd like to introduce themselves, any other representative that have not... Uh, Francis, okay. Francis, I, I, um, I invited Francis to the platform. She's from the UK. Francis, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Francis Bajina. I'm a nursery uh, manager owner at UK for children with special needs. I'm a friend of Helen, and I'm here today just to listen and observe what happens on the platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Francis, for, uh, for joining. You are welcome to the platform. Okay. Looking at the time, uh, Prince, do we have any, we do have time for, to introduce any more? We have nobody else. Is there anybody else who hasn't been introduced that would like to, okay. Um, is it, uh, is it Juliet? Juliet, if you're on the, if, if you'd like to unmute, thank you for muting. You're welcome to the platform. Please introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, Eya Juliet Edo from Togo. This is my first time of participating in a huge uh, forum. So uh, I hear about this forum through a friend 
that is named Russell. So I hope to uh, gain some experience. My language is French, but <laughs> I try the English too. Thank you. Excellent. You're welcome. You're welcome, Juliet Knights. Thank you for joining us on this platform. Thank you so much. Um, okay, before I, I hand back to Prince, is there anybody else who would like to introduce themselves on the platform who we, that we can acknowledge? Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to hand over now to um, the, the founder of this uh this great network. Um, this is it's Prince, um, One Africa Forum. Prince, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, just if you want to say something before we introduce the first guest speaker, because I know Sonia's been on the on the platform for a while now. Um, would you like to say something quickly? Okay. Thank you very much, um, Helen. Uh, thank you, and thank you to everyone. And I, I'm sure everyone can hear me. Thank you so much for introducing yourself and from wherever you're joining from, we appreciate you. And uh, we are looking to have more of them more pretty soon. Uh, Helen, uh, Sonia is, is in the room, but uh, I think she's trying to join it with a different device and I'm struggling to find her here, uh, just so she can join. Okay, you've made, a, you've made an admin on here, is she? She's, 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 she's on there. Hi there. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. So I, I think I'm going to disconnect from my phone and then let me know if you can see me now in the waiting room. Is that okay? Okay, friends, if you yeah. can. Thank you. Let me disconnect. Um, so, yes. Um, and also, I, I, you, I made you a host as well, um, Helen, so you can... Yeah, so you can uh, just help me on those on those texts. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, our first speaker, uh, who is uh, Sonia, will be joining us, but she's uh, she's a bit uh, uh, delayed. And our our the first rendition from Conscious. I'm just getting that information now. Uh, Conscious is trying. To uh, work out around uh, getting the Zoom app up. Uh, he's actually joining us from Clubhouse and um, he cannot, of course, uh, connect from there for, to this. So we're just going to give him a few minutes. But in the meantime, we have actually all just... Thank you very much. And but can you, can you hear me? I'm here. This is Conscious. It's there. Welcome. This is Conscious. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yeah. Conscious, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Okay, right, thank um, you very much. Yeah. Prince, do you want to introduce Conscious? Um, just to say a little bit about him or all right. Um just introduce Conscious. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce uh, Conscious. This is the first time I actually I'm getting to see his face. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this, is not a, this is not the first time. It's not the first time I'm hearing his voice, and um, also uh, hearing the words in his song. Actually, he's one very underground artist that lives uh, according to his name, Conscious. So he sings songs that actually are very, 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 very. Uh, uh, how do I say it now? and also gives a lot of exposure. And I'm aware that Conscious has written a song for this conference and also for One African Forum. And uh, so Conscious, you were supposed to be our, our opening act, but here you are. Welcome and welcome again. Uh, it's over to you. Please just give us a brief about yourself and uh, just take a few minutes and introduce yourself and give us a beautiful... Thank you, Conscious. So much. All right, um, um, yeah, I go by the name Conscious Man. I'm from Nigeria, um, Middle Bell part of Nigeria, just Plateau State. Um, music is what I do. Um, I also do video production. I'm a director and an editor. Uh, so um, I got into this group yesterday. Uh, Scotty invited me to the group, to the room, sorry and introduce me, so uh, I, I 
exclude you. I think his screen has just frozen, but um, I'm sure he'll be back. So conscious, conscious, if you can hear us, uh, it's just uh, if you come back, just jump in right into the rendition because of your, of your connection, so that we don't have to uh, take too much of your time. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, is um, Rehabets were ready to host our first uh, speaker? She's ready. Uh, please get ready. We'll be hosting our first speaker again, and also. Uh, just please let me know when you're back now so we can move right into the program proper i am ready when you are ready you'll let me know when you'd like me to introduce the the guest speaker noted thank you conscious okay i think his network is playing out should we go to the first speaker uh, okay, I don't know, Sonia, you were trying to get on. I don't know if we were able to get you on eventually. I am absolutely on, yeah. Yeah, she's on, thank you. She's on Prince. <laughs> Hi, Sonia. That's can good. you guys see me okay? Yes, we can, we can. Cool. Okay, honey. All right. um, you're welcome. So I have the awesome privilege of welcoming our guest speaker, Sonia. She was born in Lisbon and she's a descendant of Guinea-Bissau and Portugal. Sonia is passionate about personal and professional development of young professionals. She studied European politics and has been working for more than 15 years in the financial sector. Sonia is currently a director managing multiple client delivery teams at Standard Chartered New York. Prior to joining Standard Chartered, she worked for five years at JP Morgan, and prior to that, she spent two years at the Bank of New York. Both the roles were London-based. Sonia is married and has a five-year-old son. She is the founder of Four Women by Women, a UK registered company whose main objective is to encourage, elevate, celebrate women across the globe and in particular from Luciferian communities, that is Portuguese speaking communities. For Women by Women is premised on educating, sharing experiences and leaving a legacy for the next generation. Sonia believes that we all have a social and moral responsibility to encourage and support one another. And as such, she believes it is important to practice and show empathy to each other. Sonia, you're welcome to the Global Conference. I, for one, am looking forward to your session. I told Prince that I especially want to be the one to host you. So um, um, you're welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. I first and foremost, morning, good afternoon and good evening from wherever you are. Um, I have to congratulate you all for this initiative. I think initiatives like this nature are what we need, right? Um, and secondly, I think the event, it's one of those things that we're here to listen, we're here to learn from one another, right? Um, it's an honor and a privilege for me to share my experience, my lived experience, and I'm hoping that at least one person can walk away with, with something that would either inspire them or would either make them change or think about how they do things, how they empower each other, how they empower women, whatever the case may be. And third, I appreciate the invitation. Um, like I said, it, it is truly an honor, although it's like almost 7 a.m. in New York, um, but hey, it's what we do for the continent. Um, so, so when Prince asked me to talk about um, the, the future of banking in Africa, I was thinking to myself, I was like, oh my God, I've never worked in the continent. Who am I? Am I equipped to talk about the, the, the industry in a continent that I had no um, lived experience? And I paused and I was like, guess what? No, I, I do have um, the, the experience from someone that's been working in the industry uh, for almost 16 years, primarily in the West, but we can actually transport that experience 
to the continent. And that is the whole purpose of it, building that bridge. The topic itself, the, the, the future, I'm going to talk about the current status, how I see it based on experience uh, and Anything that I say is on my behalf and not on behalf of my bank, which is Standard Chartered Bank. So my views and thoughts are what I'm ex um, sharing at the moment. The, the, the current environment or banking environment in, in the continent, I would say that it's extremely optimistic. And I say this because we have seen a huge growth. There's a huge expansion at the moment, specifically when you talk about banks from Nigeria or Kenya and SA. If I could just ask that we meet whoever is not intervening, I think it's just better for everyone's experience. Is Thank that okay? you. Sorry about that, Sonia. No Thank problem. You. No problem. It's difficult to manage these things, you know, but hey, it's, it's the, the world that we're living in at the, at the moment. Um, but, but so like I was saying, so we've seen a lot, right, that expansion, especially from these three countries that I mentioned, the big players, right, um, the Nigeria, the, the Kenya, and, 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 and you see how this is happening in a gradual manner, and I'm seeing happening through a lot of mergers and acquisitions. And why? Because I think there's a huge appetite in making sure that we have a cohesive, cohesive environment, banking environment um, in, in the continent. Now, with that optimistic look that I just gave you, I think the key things that we should continue to focus on to make sure that that expansion, uh, you know, transboards the continent and we are seen as a key players in the West, we need to do a couple of things and I'll, I'll try and list it. I know the time is, is, you know, of essence, but I'll list it on a couple of things. One, we need to think about our regulatory environment, right? So the regulatory lands, landscape when it comes to financial services in the continent is still developing, right? It's not a par with the West. It's not a part with the European Union, for example, where they have a cohesive regulatory framework. So in Africa, due to our, you know, different legal jurisdiction, uh, the, the challenges with, with the languages, all of these makes it quite difficult to um, implement regulations. But I think we are going towards the right direction, right? I think the end goal is to create a pan-African committee that will make sure that when regulations are being discussed and are being, you know, implemented, we have this one front that we approach that and that will strengthen our banking environment. The second piece, which for me, I'm very passionate about is the human capital. We often hear about human capital. And for those that don't know, human capital is, is an essence, is, is key for the development of the economy of any country. That has been proven with a lot of research. And what human capital means in very lean terms is the the skills, the knowledge that our people need to perform their functions, their roles, right? In any industry, in any company, any firm that you have, you need people. You need people, you need people to do the work, you need people to manage, um, and you need people to lead, right? So when you think about human capital, having in the back of your mind is the, oh, the yeah. quality of people that you have running an industry or a sector. And banking is no different to any other industry, right? Human capital is key for the performance of the sector and is key for our people as well to um, learn and develop. And if I pause there to talk about the learning and development piece, how do we do that? We create pathways for our uh, employees. We create um, the development uh, programs, where you identify talent, where you encourage talent. And at what age do you do that? At a young age. And that is why it's pertinent when we all come together and we recognize the challenges that we have from different, you know, the spectrum is quite wide, but once we recognize the challenges that we have in a particular, uh, um, in a particular sector, in a particular uh, area, we can then uh, uh, take action. The third piece that I would say it's, it's, um, it's definitely the innovation, which a lot of us are passionate about, right? This digital space that we often talk about. I think if I can pick 
Nigeria and Kenya, for example, these are in the forefront. These two countries we know, and it has been for a number of years, they are in the forefront of that digital space, right? We are seeing more and more telecom companies partnering with banks to achieve that, right? Whereby we, we talk about financial inclusion, right? And I'm picking that topic um, and I'm doing that on purpose. Financial inclusion has been discussed for a number of years, right? And we often think, how do we achieve that? There's billions of people. I think the last research was like 300 and odd billion people, million people that didn't have a, a bank account, right? So how do you do that? It's not accessible to all. So when I'm bringing this to, to the digital world, if you know that there is a vacuum there, there is something that needed to be addressed, then you see how the digital world has been able to tackle that gap that we have in the continent. People are now having more access to, um, to financial services through their mobiles, as simple as that. Um, and, and, and then with that access to, um, to financial services comes education, that educational piece. Right. So combining the fact that there is a need to educate um, our people, you do that through these tools and and brings me to the very last topic, which is the partnership, a partnership between banking and fintechs, as well as entrepreneurs. Right. Very, very key when we talk about entrepreneurship in Africa. Banking is essential for any entrepreneur that wants to launch a business, want to scale up their businesses. But a lot of people do not have that access, like I mentioned. And this is why fintech companies come into play, right? And when you see that partnership between banks and fintechs to provide a service to the client, because that is the end goal, that is truly how we move forward, right? In terms of, I'll just quickly recap those points. Regulatory landscape, human uh, capital, innovation, so technology, the digi digital, and fourth, the partnership between banking, fintech, and entrepreneurs. That is a four point. And I'll, I'll come to a close soon because I want to bring something that is a key element, women. What is the role of women in all of this? We know that it's been proven that women plays a key part in the economy of any country, let alone in Africa. We have our traders, our informal traders. They bring a lot of money to the economy. It might not be formal, but we all know one way, shape or form. In my country, Guinea-Bissau, I've seen it. A lot of the women in different sectors, they're the ones that are driving commerce. Agriculture, we see women doing that. And I think it's the same in a lot of other, our country, other countries in, in our continent. So, Women have to be empowered to do that, right? I often say to people, what does empowerment mean? Empowerment just means it's a self-belief. You, you need to believe in yourself. You need to kill all these limiting beliefs that we grew up with. You need to have someone that is helping you recognize the skills that you have, the talent that you have to do whatever you feel like you want to do, right? No one should govern or dictate what you want to do in any industry. I speak for banking because it's my, my, my uh, area of expertise and that's where I've always worked, but it applies to everything. So if you think about it, we have a huge gap between male and female in a lot of like leadership positions, for example. And that is a battle here in the West, whereby a lot of us uh, extremely, uh, you know, we are experts and we are, we are great at what we do, but not everyone achieves a level of prominence. Not because it's just not, they're not competent, but because maybe an opportunity has not been given, right? So if you think about it, what's happening in the West, what's happening in the continent, the problems remain the same, irrespective of the industry, right? Women have to be empowered. Women have to be helped to recognize the role that they play in the economy of their respective countries. And, and when, when the introduction was being made and say, oh, I founded the For Women by Women, it is precisely that, right? Is women in the uh, center of the equation, okay? And for these conversations, we need men to participate in that. So combining all of that, I'll wrap up to say, 
I see the future of the banking in Africa with a lot of optimism. I know there's a lot of challenges that we have and that we need to tackle in the in the in the um, areas that I mentioned. But I think we are in the right direction, right? I think we are in direction where we're finding more cohesiveness between our countries. At least it starts regionally, but we've seen that more, you know? And I think we have to continue to do that. And I close it to say, women stand up and continue to um, project yourself, continue to put your hand up and say, I can do it. You don't have to wait for someone to give you the authorization to move forward. You do that. You are capable and you are enough. My last comment would be, or, or a sentence that I would end it with is, in, in the process of empowering someone, your own power does not get diminished. So let's continue to send the elevator back down to, for others to ascend in different ways and shape and form. So thank you all for your time. I'm happy to take on any questions or if there's any thoughts, reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sonia. Um, Prince, will you allow me to open the floor for any questions and answers? Okay. Um, I think something that has definitely stuck with me is for when you elevate somebody, it doesn't make, it doesn't reduce your power in any way. I think that's such a powerful statement because many a times people think that if you give them opportunities or if you give opportunities to others, it makes you, it gives, it, it, it takes away what you have. So I think that's very important. That's something that has definitely stuck with me. So um, everybody have opened the floor for questions and answers. Um, I will, I, will, I will take the privilege of being the host, um, hosting Sonia, and I will ask the first question. Thereafter, I will, <laughs> thereafter I will go around and, um, yes, Keith, I've seen you. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, then after I will, I will ask questions. Um, I'll take other questions from the floor. Um, so you've spoken about digital currencies, cryptocurrencies. So I just want to know that how do you think cryptocurrencies will actually shape the future of banking in Africa. So I know that there's this, the concept of central bank digital currencies that is coming up. There's this whole, you know, fact of trying to regulate cryptocurrencies and bringing them into the regulatory framework. I'm just looking at the infrastructure of Africa as well. How do you see virtual currencies shaping the future of banking and the provision of financial services in Africa? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I try and avoid to talk about uh, the, the, the cryptocurrency simply because it's such a debatable it's, it's, a, it's a topic that you have people in the different uh, sides of the spectrum right in the beginning when it came up a lot of people didn't think that it was something that would stick right it was just a bubble that was going to bust but guess what fast forward we've seen more of that especially in the west it's taking the west by storm and we are slowly seeing that the same in the continent right so i think if it's regulated, if we create a framework for that, it will play a huge part in that accessibility that we talked about, right? Because not everyone will be, and even now here, we're not going to be banking in the same manner, right? People want things to be practical, right? If we think about what the pandemic has done for us, most of us couldn't even go to a branch. A lot of us before the, the pandemic, we weren't really keen on that, going to branches for you know, anything we wanted to do with our uh, financial uh, banking services. And I think having anything that is electronic would be helping us as clients, right? So if I put myself in a client's shoe, is I want something that is fast, that is simple, that is quicker, that is easy to navigate. I don't want anything complex. So I think the answer would be, it's early stages for us in the continent. We need a better structure and we need to make sure that it's regulated, right? Because these kind of um, new products can also open the, the Pandora's box for a lot of issues um, uh, in terms of fraud and whatnot. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else who has a question. I can't see hands raised. So Prince, please, can you help me to identify people whose hands are raised? Recording in progress. Hi, oh, Zainab, so have nobody at the moment. Does anybody have any questions that like, they would like to put forward, please? 
if you'd like to raise your hands. If there are no questions, I'll con I'll continue um, um, asking more questions. Okay. All right. So, thank you. Um, you also there's mentioned. A hand, there's a hand um, up here. Oh, Hello. sorry. Where's, where's the hand? Hello. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I thought you were just in, uh, interpreting. Yes. Sorry. You can yes, ask a question. Um, I have a complaint that some people are not seeing the interpretation that I'm doing. That's the reason why I raised my hand. You can sit. Yeah. So please, I hope you can see me now. So that I can continue. Is it? Okay. So my, my, my next question is, so we spoke about the use of, um, of FinTech and in the provision of banking services. So for example, um, the provision of credit, normally you'd have to have a credit record before they provide credit to you. And of course, somebody coming from a rural place in Africa might not have um, a credit record or anything like that. So how, how can banks now better use fintech and algorithms in order to provide financial services to those people? And what sort of initiatives do banks need to undertake for them to educate people and, and make them financially literate? So things like having life cover, having funeral cover and things like that. What, what sort of things should banks do in order to you know, push those sort of initiatives? Yeah, so, so that's what I was alluding to when I said that it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's key if we want to see that progression of our banking system or financial services overall in Africa, banks need to partner with those fintech companies, as well as when you think about telecoms, it is key that banks have those partnerships with the telecom companies. What can banks do? I think traditionally, a lot of the education comes with, you know, individuals going to a bank, into a branch, right? And only when they discuss with their bankers, they will then understand all the complex products the, the banks have to offer to their, their clients. But now I truly think, and especially to cater to those that are not in the, um, you know, they are in the suburbs or outside of the main city, you have to go to the actual uh, uh, um, areas, right? Those cities, you have to go and create those educational programs. You need to carry yourself and go to the deep ends of a particular city, out, uh, city outside of the capital and bring those, um, those lessons and educational material to our traders, to our women in the agriculture. Literally be physically in, the, in, the, in those cities, run programs for like a week. That is the only way that we can achieve that, right? A prime example that I see happening in, in Guinea-Bissau, we have a lot of um, bank managers taking a couple of staff members and they'll go for a week to those rural places and they'll explain, these are the, the services that we have to offer. You might not have bank or track record because that is essential in the conservative way of, of you know, the traditional way of doing uh, banking. But now with the fintech, we can do that. And that's why we need to collaborate. And fintechs, they're not there yet to offer certain kinds of more sophisticated products, but certainly for the basics, for the ones that you have Sonia that just set it up, uh, you know, I just have a SME, like a, a, a small enterprise. I am not gonna know all of the complex products that the bank can offer me. I, and, and I think one thing that I have to mention as well, women in particular, we're more conservative in the way that we do business, in the way that we launch and, and scale up. Men are more, you know, they're more daring in the way that they do things. We are more conservative. We save more. We, we're more like, okay, we're gonna need to take care of the family. So I can't really spend what I have. That is why I think it's very, very important to your point to have these sessions locally with the people that are transacting and doing these businesses. It does make a difference, right? Because the other thing that is sort of the elephant in the room, the, 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 the illiteracy is still there, right? So we need to find mediums to communicate with our people that makes sense, something that is simple and efficient. Right, because often banking is a bit complex in the way that we explain things. But let's break it down to Lehman terms. Thank you very much for that. Um, I see, um, Guguza, your hand is up. Do you have a question? Yes, I do have a question. Thank you. 
Yes, the floor uh, is yours, you may ask. Okay, thank you. Hi, Sonia. Hi there. I'm Kakamba. I'm calling from South Africa. Nice to meet you. Yes. Um, I would like to ask a question concerning transformation in the banking sector. Um, mm -hmm. I am posing this question in reference to the uh, terms of preferential treatment. Um, given the backgrounds of our countries, we know that uh, people from disadvantaged groups or marginalized groups have um, so much difficulty accessing benefits in the banks. And you know, most of banks are international banks. Most of the countries have got um, international banks. Um, people aren't treated the same because of race and because of policies that are not updated. Uh, po policies from the past are still being um, used in the banking sector. Uh, so you find out people from different races aren't getting enough support from banks. There's preferential treatment. Uh, certain uh, people from certain races are getting all the support for their businesses. They are getting benefits. Their businesses are moving on, they're moving forward. While other uh, races uh, are stuck, they cannot get support from banks and stuff. So what is your say regarding transformation in the banking sector? Thanks. No problem. Th thank you for the question. I, I think this is uh, it's one of those questions that I think we know it exists and we know there's a lot of work that needs to be done to change that. And it starts with changing the mentality and changing the mindset is not an easy thing to do. When I mentioned fintechs, right, this is where I think fintechs can actually close that gap because if you are doing an application through an app, right? There are certain elements that will be removed. They're not gonna see um, what you look like, right? The race card doesn't, won't really play a part, but that's my opinion. I don't know how deep that is in SA or any other countries, but the way I see the FinTech playing a key role in this particular discrimination, which is you know exactly what it is, is that it should remove all of these cards that are yeah, traditionally people to have shopping to do tra traditionally seen. I think someone is really <laughs> muted. I don't know. Okay. Um, I'll try and I'll continue talking and see if we can all hear me because there was someone else that was yeah. Uh, yeah. So so like I was saying, I, I think it. I think it's a, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible, sorry okay. about that. No problem. I think it's a combination of things, right? The, the mindset, the fact that we can use um, technology to remove some of these little discriminations. And it goes back to my first point that I made about regulations and how we implement these things. If we have these things in place, and if we have a strengthened regulatory uh, uh, landscape, it makes it difficult for these things to happen on the ground, right? That's why I said my full disclaimer in the beginning, I'm not in the continent, I've not experienced it, I've heard about it, but the way I would see it, and this is from the lens of someone that is not there, you know, I'm in the diaspora, we have to trust that there will be regulations that will tackle these, we have to trust that FinTech will help remove some of these cards that are played when services are being offered to clients. And that's one of the things that we mentioned on the question that was asked about um, the, the partnerships, right? Traditionally speaking, you need a track record to be given X, Y, Z. I use myself as an example. If I'm to get a mortgage, if I'm to get a loan, the bank will see how much I'm earning or you know, what my expenses are, the typical thing, right? With the fintechs, they came and they, they, they caused a bit of a revolution in the way the banking is operating. So I think it's still a long way to go, but I'm, I, I have hopes that things will change. And I'm sorry that I can't give you a concrete solution, 
um, because I'm not on the ground. I hope this helps. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Adetoin, I see your hand is up. Please excuse my pronunciation of the name. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, the pronunciation is Adetoin, and the name is coming from Nigeria, from the Yoruba. Let me see, maybe you can see me, but I was putting a background picture. I think I have to remove that if you would have to see me. Now you can't, it looks like funny, isn't it? So I will do that later. And this project uh, picture I'm showing you is the Niger Awareness Track. I did 2019 is about entrepreneurship and digitalization with women and uh, youth in Nigeria across these four uh, countries that are really uh, basically uh, where it's mostly needed, where the people are getting into uh, traveling out of the country into the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a project budgeted like some with the government. So how could this be something that could be an emerging effect? Because we basically uh, transfer their hundred sewing machine for uh, people that have already have their tailoring, um, you know, uh, education. They are already designers, and they just needed something to start up with. So these people were able to immediately. Uh, start up with their life. So we organize uh, kits like um, small uh, stove equipment for women to just uh, start up with their lives. So we organize that uh, doing, uh, you know, the, the cooking uh, version of what they do anyway, but now they are better e equipped. And um, how can we um, organize that? Because this is something that surely will have a, 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 a return of invest. Thank you, Amanita. I'm done speaking. So in essence, you're giving a, a, a practical example of what is happening on the ground, right? What you're doing on the ground with, um, with these initiatives. Congratulations on that, um, Adeto. Thank you. Can I ask a uh, question? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> his, hand, his hand wasn't up. So this is this is, you know, this is my session. I'm going to use it to the best of my ability. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Go ahead, Prince. You can ask the question. No. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I mean, it just also um, what you just did just works in line with the question I was about to ask. I mean, um, thank you very much, Sonia. That's that's a, a very a beautiful lecture. Um you are an African in diaspora and you're doing such an amazing and we can pick, uh, we can we can count uh, a number of uh, African women who are really doing well across ac across the world and uh, all around the world as well. Um, but from your experience and from what you see from uh, from from New York, you're in New York, right? Yes, I am. So, yeah, yeah, thank you. From what you see when you sit there and you look at Africa, uh, with a gap, you know, we you actually talked about education and also empowerment of women. Now we. We can, we can actually say that there are more educated men or there were more educated than women in Africa, right? I mean, that's now debatable. But I think from, if we have to be realistic, that's, that's, that's actually what we are pushing. At. Do you think that uh, the women in Africa who we, you gave example of some underground women, right? Do you think that they are ready for this change? You think that women are ready for this change? And when, when I make change, I know we are going to go to the conversation of uh, we need to educate them and empower mm -hmm. them and so on. Right, fine. Uh, but are you, do you think that they are ready for this empowerment, for this education? I say this because sometimes some engage some conversations we have with uh, some, uh, some women and maybe just a few men as well, especially from our campaign that we run across, uh, across the continent. You, you, you get to see this this um, attitude of, of, of from women who either they are not they are not confident enough or they are scared or they are just they just not ready to adjust to the new to the new norm you know and it's you you don't want to force them right and also you try to convince them but you don't want them to actually do it tomorrow and uh, tend to feel like oh well I, I shouldn't have done this as well and so have some form of regret so now that's the question from what you see. 
do you think that the women in Africa are ready for this change? Because there's a huge revolution going on right now. And yeah. we're adjusting to the new normal and talking about FinTech and the post-COVID and everything. Are they ready for this change? If your answer is yes, um, then where do we go from here? If the answer is no, where do we go from here? <laughs> I like your leading question, but um, th thank you for the question. I, I think this could be a session on its own. Um, when I do master classes with For Women by Women, we often talk about some of the topics you mentioned, right? Not just empowerment, because empowerment is a fashionable, it's a word that is now in fashion. But in practice, what does that mean? For me, I think we're not fully there yet. I think we are getting there women are becoming more hungry for knowledge, right? Women are becoming more receptive to hear and listen experiences from others. And I'll tell you what, there's one thing that I'll tell you for a fact, it's not just women in Africa. The women in the diaspora, and I'll speak about African women, that is why I founded this particular forum for Women by Women, to, to tap into the, the issue we have with the, with the Lusophone countries. So countries that speak Portuguese, right? The ex-colonies, the Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde. We have a challenge there because I mentioned earlier, we have our limiting beliefs and that's what we need to tackle, right? And if you think about the women that is sitting right now or you know that is trading in Africa, some rural place, and compared to the women that is sitting here in New York that happens to be African and is an immigrant and is, you know, trying to get better lives for, for their families. The difference is the difference there is just the continent. If your mindset is not there to observe and consume knowledge, there's no difference, right? You're just in a different continent. I experience it often because when I talk to some of my mentees, they ask me, how did you do it, Sonia? How did you make it? My answer is always, I've not made it. In my view, I haven't made it yet. Yes, I have a good position. Yes, I am in a great center. Yes, I work in a bank. I can't complain from that perspective, like financially, but that is not the end all, right? For me, it's about education. It's about continued uh, learning. I think we need to continue to push the agenda, right? You launched, when you guys launched this initiative, that is a one step closer to the end goal, right? You will get, um, you will get, um, what's the word? Not rejection, but you will get some people sort of either doubting, not understanding the end goal, but it is in you to not stop, right? You have to continue pushing. So to answer your question, I think it's a combination of things. Um, I think certain parts of um, certain parts of the continent, people are more hungry for it. Uh, they are more ready, for, for lack of a better word. And the same thing we see in diaspora, right? And that is why we have to continue to build the bridge. And that is why the first time that we spoke, we had our introductory uh, meeting, I said, I am happy to do whatever I can. And help doesn't always have to be financial. Help is the exchange of knowledge. Help is the exchange of lived experience. You cannot say women can't do this if you have not given her the chance to. But women have to want to be given that chance, right? Studies always shows that there is a new role and men will say, yep, I'm ready. They will apply for it. Women, we're looking at the list to see, do I have all the skills? Oh my God, I, I can't apply for this. You know, this is a simple example that I'm giving of the limiting beliefs that we as women have. If I can say that, and I'm in the position that I am, imagine women in rural, rural areas, the, their main objective is to feed their families, is to pay for some medical bills or some medication that their kids, their husband have to take, right? So we are halfway there, I would say, Prince. But it's, it's a thought-provoking question that I think we should carry on that discussion, perhaps in other events. Um, I'd like to also bring in Cornelia into the conversation because I hear that she also does quite a lot of work 
um, with women in diaspora. And I'd like to hear your thoughts, Cornelia, on um, women and them being ready for the change that is coming. And also, what sort of bridge do you think we need to build in order to, you know, to close the gap and building the confidence in women as well to go for the, the things that they want to go for and not really shying away from things that they know that they can do? We can't hear you. Your mic is still on mute. Good day, everybody. And thank you, Sonia, for waking up very early for all of us. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Collaborative work as women again. Yes. Um, I come from another community, you know, as a South African with a very strong mother who has been an entrepreneur, has been a community uh, worker and, and, and. So uh, my background is a little bit different to some others that I deal with. And um, the woman I deal with here in the EU and um, coming from different countries and different circumstances as well. When I get posed this question, I sit down and I think of, how do I deal with this? So I educate myself first to understand where they're coming from. And then we educate collaboratively together. We educate each other for where we're coming from. And then we start the work where to go. And I think a very important thing is, everybody always say, oh yeah, where do we start? Where do we go? And where do I connect the dots? But you always have to realize you have to start with educating our women. When we educate our women, I even as a South African woman who didn't have to deal with a lot of situations that a lot of African women and women from other parts of the world are dealing with, I went into boardrooms sometimes, or I walked into NGOs, and I just had a conversation very ignorantly. And I was said, Cornelia, you can't do this. I didn't know that I was doing wrong. So I had to educate myself as well to get to know this woman. And when you start there at this level, at this basis where you start educating our woman, then you go to the next level, then you can move on and then you build your house and then you boom, I'm telling you. And when women get together, they are forced to be reckoned with. Desmond Tutu in South Africa always say, I don't like this woman thing because when the woman gets together, things are happening, things are changing. So I'm very excited for this uh, conference for the next two days as well, because I know that um, even if we just change one woman or one man's life because behind successful women as well are men who drives us to do what we are doing as well. So yeah, that is my answer to you. Education, it all starts with education. Thank you, Sylvia. Sonia. Thank you very much. Helen, I see you've unmuted your mic. Do you, is yeah, there something that you wanna add as well? Sorry, I was just agreeing with what Cornelia was saying. Yeah. Yes, we have to empower women. And that's why I just, I just could, I was so excited about what you were saying. <laughs> and yes, when we are coming, women, we are empowering. We are, we are here. And, and, it's, and it's, as, you, as, um, as Sonia said, empowerment has become a word that we've just, it's like everybody is using, but there's no initiative. Nobody's actually doing anything to empower. And it's sort of education. If we start with one person, as you said, most women are just, you know, other looking after the kids, paying the bills but there's so much we can do so i just love what Cornelia was saying what sonia was saying as well so i'm in agreement and thank yeah. you so much it's brilliant thank you so excited thank you. and if yeah, i can add you. something quickly right yeah. we we are all literally doing that right in sharing our time in sharing our experience education often we think about the formal education classroom this is an educational uh, initiative because we are learning from one another right if I can share something from my experience in the corporate world and this could serve as an inspiration to someone I hope 
there have been times that I go into certain rooms, I am the only woman. And often I'm the only black woman in that room. Now imagine if I didn't have the confidence, if I didn't know what I was capable of, what I'm bringing to the table, trust me, I'll be shying away from it. But like my, my, my esteemed leaders here said, we do not shy away from it, right? I actually love those conversations. I do not want anyone to pigeonhole me into thinking that this is just another Black woman. I am Black. I am proud to be Black. And I want to make sure that I'm sending that elevator back down, like I mentioned before. It is our duty. Cornelia mentioned something like, you know, I go into a room and if I don't know, that's precisely the point. If someone has done the walk already, pass the baton to someone else. That is our duty and that is our responsibilities, okay? And that's what I wanted to add to the conversations with my dear sisters. Thank you, Sonia, that was excellent. Sorry to interrupt you, Zainab. <laughs> we, we have to make more impact and not to be fearful, you know, because I just think it's our time now. You know, we're entrepreneurs, we have so much. We're not just women, as we said, we're not just black women. We're business women, we're mothers, we're educators, we're this. You know, we're not a label, we're not going to be confined to one corner. So let me not take up the time because I'm not a guest speaker. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we're also here to share, Helen. So we're happy to hear your thoughts and your ideas as well. Um, just checking whether or not there's any other questions. Anybody else who's got a question yes, to there ask? Yes, one from Facebook. Yes, thank you, Sebastian. So the question is from Barbara Konadu. And she says, education is very important, but the readiness and acceptance of the women to transform or be educated is a major concern. How can one be motivated to accept and show the readiness to be transformed? I think I can take a, uh, 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 I can give it a try on that one. I think it's part of what we just shared now, right? When you share your experience, it serves as an encouragement for others, right? I, I, I think it was um, Maya Angelou that said this. She said, when you get, you give. When you learn, you teach. That is how we start. It's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to be, you know, one approach serves the you know, purpose and, and it serves for everyone. But you have to start from somewhere. I truly believe in uh, a sharing of lived experience as a great starting point. And, and I think that is my, my, my take on it. You know, in addition to everything that we shared about being on the ground, sharing, educating, but certainly when one sees that Sonia, Helen, or Cornelia, anyone is able to do it, that certainly serves as an, as an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much. I particularly like that quote by, by Maya Angelou, when you get, you give, and when you learn, you teach as well. I think that's, a, that's also quite important. Um, okay, in the absence of any other questions, before we close off your session, I'm just going to take you a little bit back to, um, to, to banking, and maybe the question may be a little, um, you know, it may deviate from, from banking specifically, but I want to ask, what are your thoughts on Africa having a single currency? Do you think it's something viable? Do you think it's something we can see happening in the future? I see Prince, I see Prince is laughing there in the background. Um, um, so just, just a bit of context. I'm, I'm thinking of further of doing some research in, in a single currency for Africa and related matters. So he knows that. So that's why he's busy laughing when <laughs> I'm bringing up the question. <laughs> I, I, I think right now I see it as a bit of an utopia. Um, we, yeah, if you, if you think about the aspects that I mentioned earlier, in terms of the regulation, in terms of our legal constraints, uh, different jurisdictions, it is a challenge. And also you have different powerhouses in the continent. So achieving that can be a huge challenge. And if we pick um, the, the, the EU, right, when the euro currency came about, we saw that, you know, now it's established and everything. But in the beginning, I remember coming, you know, I, I was in Portugal at the time when the euro was, uh, when our local currency, Scudo, was converted into euro. You saw countries like Spain and Portugal and Greece, they're not at the same level as the big Germans and, and France of this world, right? Can we achieve that in Africa? Maybe, 
not at this stage. I think we did that with the CEFA, right, in West Africa, because I know Guinea-Bissau is part of it. We have, but it's very imbalanced. So I think the 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 the, the it's not a level playing field yet, uh, but it's certainly something that we can aspire to achieve. But we need a lot of work in that space. <laughs> We need we need to be more united. <laughs> Absolutely, we need yeah. to. We need to. Mm. All right. Listen, um, we can't you. even we can't even travel freely like that in our country. Yeah, that's so true. We want us to have a currency. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but I think the free trade agreement that's a step in the right direction as well. Yes. So hopefully, yes. I'm looking <laughs> forward to that, session, that actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for your time. Um, you know, I forgot you were in the state, so you did wake up much earlier than the rest of us. Thank you so much for that. No problem. Um, <laughs> Helen, I see your camera has gone off. At this point, it's the time where I hand back over to you. Um, thank you so much again, Sonia. It was such an insightful session. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, looking forward to further engagements and conversations with you. Thank you. It was an honor and a pleasure. Um, you know where to find me. I am here for whatever you need. And, you know, congratulations once again for this amazing event. And I'm sure we will walk away with something that would, um, you know, make us feel a bit empowered and encouraged to do and to, to, to create change. Thank you all. Thank you, Sonia. That was amazing. Thank you, Zaina, for sharing that. That was so great. I'm so empowered. Thank you, Sonia. You have a fan in me and I'll be networking with you. <laughs> um, what a great start. We started off with a woman, you know. I always relate Africa to a woman. I mean, I when I went to Ghana, I remember I just felt so much passion for the land. I just felt that she'd been abused, she'd been raped, she'd been so many things. I connected with the land of Africa and I see her as a woman and I see the Western countries like, you know, just you know, taking so much. So, you know, starting with a woman with this conference, we now hand over to the next guest speaker. Thank you so much, Sonia. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, we have, please, please, my apologies for the pronunciation. If I get your name wrong, I can see he's already on the platform. Malobi, Malobi, I just want to just say a little bit about him. He is um, into agribusiness uh, space in Nigeria for many years um, and exporting as well. Um, he's an agent, sorry, he's from an, um, he's from Pan, he, sorry, he's focusing on Pan-African traders and his company creates tech products to boost trade with Africa. So please, our next speaker, if you're ready, if you can unmute, if you can put on your camera as well, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Yes, hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you um, very much, everyone, for having me. Thank you for organizing this great event. We do need more of these more often, um, getting all the stakeholders, getting the best minds together to brainstorm um, how we can improve um, our individual communities and the, the continent at large. Um, like Helen mentioned, my name is Malobi Ogbechi. Um, born in Nigeria, um, lived in the UK for quite a while, and I moved back to Nigeria last year, um, just before uh, the peak of the COVID, to be honest. And uh, like she said, I started off um, exporting an ancient grain from West Africa called Fonio. Um, it's uh, essentially one of the oldest grains to ever be cultivated, but yet even Nigerians themselves don't know about this grain, yet it's indigenous to West Africa. Um, this grain has been used uh, for many years by the ancient Egyptians, um, all the way up to people in Senegal, and it's uh, great um, food for people that have diabetes, etc. So um, please do your research and learn about this grain because we need to be talking about food and nutrition and healthy eating and using these crops that uh, are drought resistant and that can help um, in parts of Nigeria and Africa that are affected by climate change. Um, so I started off exporting this grain and um, by getting into the export and agribusiness space, um, I saw a lot of the different challenges that I was having, and I figured, you know, other people would have these similar challenges. So I decided to create the Pan African Traders Company. Uh, Pan African Traders is essentially a tech company that creates tech solutions to enable trade within Africa. So one of our products is the Pan African Traders Marketplace. Um, if you go into my LinkedIn, Malobi Ogbechi, you'll see all, all these companies uh, for reference. But um, Pan-African Traders Marketplace is kind of like Alibaba, 
but basically focus on the African continent, um, B2B trade, large volumes, um, focus on boosting trade within the continent. Um, so that's, that's our first product. Um, right now we're going through an iteration where we're building a new website. Um, the second product I, I, I built is, um, you know, I know um, what was mentioned earlier was education, education, education. So um, I built a platform called Afriverse. Um, that's A-F-R-I-V-E-R-S-E dot C-O. So Afriverse is essentially an e-learning marketplace. Um, so anyone from the continent or the diaspora can create their own course for free and you know charge however much they want to and let other people learn from them because a lot of us have knowledge that we we don't appreciate as much but we don't understand that other people can you know create courses for for our brothers and sisters in, in africa and in diaspora so uh, we've got people creating courses on self-development um we recently launched an export course if you want to learn how to export from africa um we've got a language course we've got swahili yoruba Igbo, etc etc so We've got so the first one was the marketplace, second one was the e-learning, and then the, the newest project we're working on, which hasn't been launched yet, is a logistics platform. Um, so what we found is that a lot of people, when they want to export goods to um, the UK to, to USA, it's quite expensive because if you send it by air, um, you oftentimes pay a premium because it takes it, it takes a shorter amount of time, but it's actually a lot more expensive to send stuff stuff by air. So once you start sending thousands of kilograms of products, you have to actually send it by a sea container. Um, for any of you that has been in the you know, exporting industry, you'll know that most of the time, if you want to send big amounts of products, you send it by sea. Um, so what we've essentially done is we've de democratized access to exporting. So we're allowing people to share spaces within a shipping container. So think of it as um, an Uber pool for exporting so you can share a container with your friends and family or colleagues um or also if you're importing um into the states or into to 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 wherever you are in a diaspora you can share a container say for example you you want to um get 20 tons of shea butter but you know you for, for you to get that by yourself is it's a lot right so you can get your friends and family one person can get two tons another person can get three tons of cocoa butter and you can essentially pool your, your money together and, and share their shipping. So these are the sort of innovative technologies that we're creating. And as we go and we grow and we learn, um, we're going to keep growing and creating more products um, to help other people. Because essentially what we're trying to do is as, as I'm building my export business and as it's growing, I'm seeing things that I've encountered that have made it difficult for myself. So what I'm trying to do is make it easier for people that are coming behind me to tap into this space because at the end of the day, we need to start getting into the, to the international trade. Um, in order, I'll give you a, a brief um, understanding of what's going on internationally. T trade within the, the European nations is at about 69%. So trade going between UK, Spain, Europe, et cetera, is about 69%. Um, trade within the Asian nations is at about 59%. But trade within Africa, and this is what we need in order to boost the African economy to create more jobs, trade within Africa is at a mere 14%. So we've got a long way to go, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to help people, we're trying to educate people on agribusiness, educate people on exporting, educate people on how to start trading within Africa so that we can start circulating the money within Africa and not just being a commodity exporter, not just exporting raw cocoa beans and raw sesame seeds. Let's process the products, let's add value, let's get more money and keep it within the continent and let's also trade within the continent. So this is something that um, I'm really passionate about. This is what Pan-African Traders is all about. And I would love to open up the floor if anyone's got any questions uh, for me and, and then we can get the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malabi. Thank you. That was excellent. Please, if you have any questions, please, if you can raise your hands and um, the forum is open. I see Francis, is that Francis Beginia? I think he's got his hand up. 
Francis, okay, I cannot. I think you, Francis, I think you, you're meant to press the hand raising button. I don't know where that is. I'm not. She's on mute. Francis, um, would you like to answer answer question? Oh, no, I want to ask a question, if I may. Okay. Yes, of course. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, what's his name? Keith. Keith. Um, you mentioned about e-learning, and if somebody has to can launch a course. So, I'm really into special needs. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I we can, can hear you, you Francis. We oh, you. okay. So, my speciality is special needs. And I wouldn't mind launching a course, not that I'm going to charge anyone, to talk about um, special needs. Like if you've got a child and your child is developing, how to identify that your child is not meeting his or her milestones, the professionals to tap into, and how to help your child in terms of play. I wouldn't mind to put on the website something small for other members of the community to learn from. But how do I go about that? Yeah, sure. So um, just um, if you go on our website, um, you can click on well, the website is Afriverse. So A-F-R-I-V-E-R-S-E mm -hmm. mm -hmm. -E okay. dot C-O, not okay. com dot C-O. Okay. And um, if you go to the website, there'll be a button there. You can click to become an instructor. Once you click on that, we'll have a quick call with you. Normally it takes a couple of minutes just to, you know, gauge your competence in, in the subjects you want to teach. But we're, we're not too strict on it because um, we don't want, we're not making a, a an quote unquote um, academic institution, right? We're making a more informal um, platform where people like yourself might not, you know, a lot of people that have created courses on our platform have never created courses before, right? So it's more for people that are, that are in that space and also people that are experienced as well. So we'll just speak with you, make sure that you're, you know, you know the subject matter that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then once that's done, we've got tutorials online on how to upload a course. Um, we've even got a course that we're working on that teaches you how to create a course. So if you've never created a course before, um, it goes step by step, you know, what can, you know, whether you, you want to use a phone or a camera, you know, what software, just really just helping people through the first course that if they've never created one before. So yeah, the first step is just to go on the website, click on become an instructor. You just have to put in your name, email, and maybe like um, what the course is going to be about. And then our team will reach out to you. Um, and then we'll begin that conversation. And then we can also guide you through, you know, uploading the course onto the platform. But, you know, you're more than welcome like that. That's an important subject area. Um, and like you said, you don't you can you can charge for your course or you can put it on for free. So feel free to, to do whichever way that you, you please. Um, but, yeah, we need courses like that. Like I said, we 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 want it to be open. We want it to be more of a free marketplace of ideas. So um, we're not just saying, oh, you have to have a degree or this or that or whatever. Right. So please do you know reach out to us and fill out that form and we'll be happy to have your course on the platform thank you okay I'm, thank you but i'm just wondering why does it have to be a course because we have different ways of learning can it not be mm -hmm. like a seminar because somebody like me i'm really good with the talking does it have mm -hmm, to be mm -hmm. like that just a suggestion um, no 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 you can you can you can organize your course in whatever way you want right so you can have it like this meeting that we're having today, it's a recorded Zoom meeting, right? So you can just, you know, create that and record it, upload it onto Afriverse. So it doesn't have to be um, course, you know, part one, part two, um, have complicated PDFs. You can, you, it's all up to you on how you think is the best way to deliver the information, right? So it, 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 it's, when we say course, we're not just restricting it to a certain type of structure you can create the content in the way that you see fit. Um, so that, that's the way I'd kind of explain that. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Oh yeah, it does, it does. Thank you. Okay. No worries, no worries. Thank um, you, Malabi, that is great. We have another question. Malabi, could you put your details in the chat? Would that be, poss would that be possible? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I will so put... anybody else who has any other ideas My... as well, um, <laughs> maybe they can just reach out to you and we can email other people who are also interested if you could put your details in the chat that'd be really great 
Yes, I'll just put that. I'll put the uh... a link. We have one more question. I also have a question, but let's go to Joshua. Joshua, Joshua, Joel Baku. Is that Baku? Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. But Joshua, could you? You've got your hand up. Would you like to answer a question? Um, yeah, um, Joshua Joel, uh, also known as um, Conscious Man. I'm new in the Zoom. I don't know how it works much. So um, I'll, I'm following the conversation. I just <laughs> really want to know if you guys are seeing me. That's why I raised my hand. Thank you very much. Um, we can't see, but we can hear you. You need to um, click on the camera and then we can actually see you on there. Do you have a question from for Malabi? Okay, That's can you good. see me now? Yes, yeah. we can see you now. Your camera is on, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think I've been verified. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? So this is really empowering. Yes. You know, there's you can put on courses, you know, and contact Malabi. These are practical ideas that we can impact our youth. We can impact you know our next generation so if anybody else have got any courses any ideas or any questions agriculturally re related um um questions anything that you feel okay we've got somebody else we've got keith helen yes i've got one from facebook okay yes. sorry thank you sebastian go ahead all right so barbara kind of do ask a question and it goes like this okay Indeed, there's no doubt that in order to drive the economic fortitude of Africa, there must be a frantic effort towards processing and production. Unfortunately, the financial environment, the financial and environment to do so has been the major problem. How do we create the platform to access assistance? So Malobi, I've sent you the question as well in the chat. So if you take a look at it, you have a visual version of it. Yes, um, so I think so there's two parts to this. One part is, yes, I do agree that, you know, the processing and production is very important. Um, with the African continental free trade area, um, it, it's gonna make uh, more opportunities for value added goods. Um, because like we all know, Africa, we've been uh, an exporter of raw materials to the rest of the world. And most of the money is not really made from exporting raw materials, right? You know, if we look at the cocoa value chain, um, maybe 7%. Um, of yeah. the entire value chain or, or the money generated in the chocolate industry is from the actual exporters of the raw cocoa bean. You know, the, the, the processors, the ones that make the chocolate, the cocoa powder, the cocoa drinks, those are the people that make the bulk of the money in the, in the chocolate industry. So that goes for any industry from the sesame to sesame oil um, to the cashew apples to the processed cashews. So we need to tap into that. And with this new free trade area, there's going to be more opportunity for that because the trade uh, barriers are going to go down. Um, the, the, there's going to be less tariffs. And so we can start really trading in high value goods. And also with a lot of European players and a lot of African players, the, the, the European company or, or, or governments, they, they have higher tariffs, right? So for an African a company to export their chocolate to Switzerland is going to be a bit more difficult than an African company exporting to another African country because there's going to be no tariffs. So you can see there why the, the new free trade area is going to be really beautiful for that. But uh, onto the, the point about the financial uh, point, I think also another issue is that sometimes, okay, there's, there's two things. Sometimes we're underprepared for financing. And then secondly, sometimes we don't know where to get the financing. Um, I do, you know, I believe that yes, of course, there might not be that much funds available, but it's, sometimes that's not really the case. Um, even myself that's been in the agribusiness industry for a while, it took me quite a while to actually figure out where to get the funds or who's offering funds, how they're offering funds, what are the stipulations? Um, so, and this is why education is key. This is why knowledge is key. This is why we created Afriverse. So um, by next month, hopefully, um, we're going to be launching the Agribusiness 101 course. And in that Agribusiness 101 course, we're not just going to teach you about how to get into agribusiness, what to look out for, the value chains, et cetera, but we're going to teach you how to source funding, how to get financing, how to prepare yourself for financing. I feel like that is actually a big piece that's missing because um, we kind of assume that, oh, there's no money. But actually, there's a lot of money. There's a lot of money that's being thrown around. But the problem is, 
the it tends to be the larger companies, the larger corporations that get access to these funds. So what we want is for the SMEs, the smaller businesses to get access to these funds, but those SMEs need to be ready for the funds. You know, if you're looking for investment and you don't have a good business plan, a good feasibility study, you don't have proof of sales, you don't have a, a good operations, you don't have certification for your products, you're not, you're not gonna get that money. So we really got to educate ourselves on how to get the money in the first place. Um, so that's, that's the way I would put it. I, I, do, I like to look at the glass half full. I don't like to look at it and say, oh, there's no money um, because there is. We just need to know how to get the money, where the money is and how to prepare ourselves for that money. Um, and then the environment. Um, I, 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 I'm, I myself, I live in Nigeria. I do understand that there are some you know, environmental concerns. We look at security, we look at different issues. Um, but what I would say is, you know, understand your market, understand what the higher risk areas are. Even though there are risky regions of a country like Nigeria, there are also other regions in Nigeria that are a lot safer, better investment, um, less risky, and you can get a good return on. So understand the market you're playing in. And then if you are an investor or someone that's looking from the diaspora and you're looking to, at any, any African country, then you've got a, a really unique perspective because now you're not necessarily tied down to a, a specific country. You're not emotionally drawn because in business, you've got to be business minded. We can't say, oh, I have to invest here because my great ancestor is from this place. No, we have to look at the numbers. We have to look at the environment. We have to look at it as a business opportunity. We can't get overly sentimental about things. I myself am investing in Nigeria because I live here. I might contradict myself a little bit. I am passionate about making Nigeria better. But as an investor, if you're not necessarily tied down to a particular country, you have a unique opportunity. You can look at the countries that are less risk, look at countries that are better for agribusiness, better for fashion, better for automotive. You know, you, you gotta look and, and really understand the markets that you're going into. So um, yeah, if, you, if, if, you're, if you're looking to invest in Africa as well, you can send me an email. I can help you know, consult a little bit, help you to understand the different markets, especially to do with agribusiness. That's my specialty. I'm not gonna pretend to understand other industries. Agribusiness is what I understand best. So if you wanna talk about that, if you wanna invest in Africa, you can send me an email. I can, I can help with that in agribusiness. So I, I hope that was a long-winded answer, but I hope um, I, I kind of covered that. Um, but yeah, if, if there's any other questions, I'll be, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me just hand over to Zainab. Zainab, my apologies. Let me hand over to you. I know you have some questions and um, please go ahead. If you can unmute and put in your camera, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Zainab. Zainab, are you there? Zainab, are you there? So then would you please just jump in and um, then just take over from this session and uh, yeah, Zineb, are you there? I think um, someone's also got their hand up, the um, Ofush Suhene Keith has got his hand yeah. up. Okay, no. so since, I just wanted to know if you guys can see me because I'm doing the sign language application, so I wanted to be sure if you still see me. Yeah, we can see, see. you. We can see. Yes, we can. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Yes, we can see you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, um, Zineb is not here. Um, okay, um, Helen, would you please just take, take over again? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, um, do we have any other questions for Malabi? That was a great presentation, Malabi. Thank you so much. Any other questions, please? And, and just a heads up, if you, if you wanna get into, or if you're passionate about agribusiness, um, if you're passionate about tech um, in Africa, just reach out to me. Um, I'll be happy to have a conversation. Um, we're, we're all about, you know, make, enabling the next generation, enabling the future business and people and entrepreneurs. So um, if you want to collaborate, you got my email in the chat. Happy to connect. Um, actually, you know, I'm, I'm much, it's much better to reach me on my WhatsApp. So I'll just put my number there because... Um, yeah, just reach me on WhatsApp um, and yeah, we can get, get the conversation going. But yeah, it's been great so far. So yeah, if there's any other questions, let me know. If not, thank you very much for letting me have the stage. Thank you.
We are so grateful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for honoring the invitation to speak to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Prince, we're due to have a short break now. Um, if there is no other questions, um, Prince, you're on mute. Hi, Prince. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, would you have a short break before the next speaker comes? Um, do you still want us to have that short break? And um, I think we just need to open it now for uh, for discussion, conversation as well. Um, I mean, okay. thank you, thank you very much, uh, Malobi, for your session. Thank you very, very much, and it's good to have you here as well. Um, you actually you said a lot of things uh, regarding this. Uh, the agro tech and so on and how everything and I really like this, the, the work that you guys are doing in the background as well. Um, I mean, from where from where you you sit, you know, from that position, how do you think that uh, people from other sectors? Uh, I'm talking about. We just finished talking about the banking and finance, all right? And I know uh, we you highlighted something earlier. I mean, for someone asked a question talking about funding you know, and how you can get the resources. I think that was Barbara Nadu from, uh, from Facebook asking the question as well in terms of funding. Now, that's the banking sector there. I mean, or sometimes you can look at investors or whoever is interested in that area as well. But from what we, and, and you, sorry, I knew you jumped and you came in actually just when uh, Sonia was about to round up, but from what you pick and what you got and from what you understand and experience, how important and how do you think that we can really bring in the banking sector, you know, to sit at the table and have a reasonable conversation and collaborate with the agrotech sector? And in order, because um, from what I know, overall six or about 60% of uh, Africa's uh, land is arable, right? And that means there's so much, so much, uh, what do you call it, uh, so much opportunity in the agrotech sector. Now, how do we bring in the banking sector, you know, to sit at a table with the agrotech, you know, and have uh, a thriving uh, uh, brand, an African brand from the agrotech, you know, running smoothly? I mean, a lot of things we see sometimes in many African countries still do import, you know, still do import uh, agricultural produce from other continents and other countries. Well, I don't know what the trade relation might be, but I think that we have enough to feed Africa and also fill the world. So what do you think about that? What, how do you think you can work on that synergy? Yeah, so um, I think, in, in, you know, there the definitely needs to be um, more effort on the financial sector to educate people on what is available, um, rather than always having the people to try and dig out the information and search for it and find someone that teaches them how to get involved, um, they should also make an effort to say, look, these are the funds we have, this is what it's for, and this is how it can help the, the, the industry. Um, so I think they need, there needs to be more of a sort of effort in terms of the, the marketing of the funds available. Um, I know that sometimes marketing these things can get people to just see the money and get excited and, and stuff, but you know, they'll still do their due diligence. They'll still vet the people that they're speaking with and make sure that those people are actually good quality business owners. So yeah, I think on that side, that's what they need to do. In addition to that, I think there needs to be more financing for, for mechanization of, of farming. So farming equipment. Um, there's, um, in my opinion, I feel like sometimes we try to run before we can walk. Um, I've been in a few conversations where people are talking about um, drones and blockchain and Bitcoin and farm and, and agribusiness. But I feel like sometimes we're, we're trying to run too quickly. We need to go back to back to the basics. You know, the, the average farmer in Africa does not have access to a tractor. That, that alone is where we need to start. You know, just basic mechanization, providing um, tractors to farmers at an affordable rate that, where they can lease it and use it to farm their lands. Um, there's, a, there's a company called, um, I believe it's called Hello Tractor, um, and the way it works is that an investor can buy a tractor, send it to an African country, and then lease that tractor and, you know, get some funds from that. So we need more and more of that. We need more and more people taking that risk, getting loans from banks or whatever, buying those tractors, bringing them into Africa, 
and then having those farmers, small scale, medium scale, large scale, leasing out those tractors as and when they need them. So we need access to the finance as well for that. And then, and then finally, I think we need to go beyond um, the image of, of, of the small scale farmer. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes I get a bit of pushback for saying this, but as Africans, we've been sort of branded as the, 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 the continent of, of, of poverty, of continent of begging, the continent of, you know, give a dollar a day, but we need to go beyond that, right? So we need to go into a space where we're doing commercial farms, we're doing large scale production, we're doing, you know, because if we look at, for example, in the United States, most of the farmers that are producing the crops, about 80 to 90% of them are large scale commercial farmers. And by that, I mean, you know, 10 hectares, 100 hectares. But in Africa, most of the farmers, 90% or so are small scale farmers. So you can see how it's literally the, the, the reverse. And so in order for us to start competing on the global stage, we need to start embracing and creating a new image of young, young entrepreneurs, investors, big, big players that are putting money into agribusiness, making it look like real estate moguls, making it look like um, people in the fintech. And, you know, even fintech is kind of sexy nowadays. You know, everyone wants to get into fintech. They want to get into blockchain, Bitcoin, just in the same way that the fintech industry has been made uh, palatable and exciting for the younger generation. We need to make that for agribusiness, because if you put um, if you market agribusinesses, um, just, you know, an old lady in the village picking up corn with her bare hands, it's not really going to get the younger generation and, and other investors excited about it, right? So we need to change that image. We need to get into the, the age of no longer being the, the continent of just NGOs and, you know, um, you know donations and grants and, and all these things and just people just giving us stuff for us to just barely... No, we need to do big, daring, risky projects, large scale projects. And that is how we're going to transform Africa. Because if we keep playing the small scale game, not only is it bad for the image, but also if I'm trying to do 100 tons of a product, I've got one farmer over there. I've got another farmer 10 kilometers that way, another one five kilometers that way. It's not scalable because my tractor has to go from that farm to that farm to that farm. And it's just not very profitable, you know, doing the fertilizers, the cropping, organizing all those farmers, cooperatives. Yes, they're great, but we need to we need to start embracing more larger scale projects. So these are the kinds of things we need to do. And, you know, we need the financial industry to finance these things, finance those commercial projects, finance the mechanization of farming and then also finance, you know, young entrepreneurs and and. And, and let us know, where can we get the money? Because like um, the, the lady, uh, Barbara Conado said, th there's no money. You know, there's this perception that there's, there's no money available, but there is money, but people don't know that the money is available. So the, the financial sector needs to do a better job of letting people know what is available and how they can get hold of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if Zineb is back. I'd like to also have her on. Um, but Zachariah, I see that your hand is up. Um, is it in relation to this conversation? If you could just jump in, thank you. Yes, I have a question from Malobi, if that's okay. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, Malobi, for the for what you what you've been saying. Uh, thank you for all you've been doing for the content and thank you for this opportunity for letting me talk and speak. Um, I just have a quick question about how do we encourage young entrepreneurs and startups to launch their businesses in Africa rather than Asia or uh, America? How do we do that? Well, I mean, there's different ways to do it. Um, one way that um, Acon did it is just to talk about the, the, the quickness of how you can how much money you can make. So I, I myself, I was in the corporate world in the UK. I was working, making a reasonable amount of money, very comfortable, of course. But you, you, you begin to see very quickly that everything's already been built, right? In order to create something new in the US, the UK, in Asia, you have to come up with something very, very unique. And even then, someone has probably already come up with it. And there's going to be competition, which is healthy. But it's, 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 
it's not it's not new fertile ground right it's 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 something it's an it's a it's a de- quote unquote developed economy right so a lot of things have already been developed things have, are functioning well and so it's 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 a i guess you could say it's harder in that sense um obviously africa has its challenges i'm not going to say it's easy but you know going from zero to 100 as they say it's a lot easier in africa than it is in the place like the uk us diaspora etc you know you can become a fortune 500 company in in, in about five years if every if everything goes accordingly you know we have we we've, we've had recent um entrepreneurs like the the ones from paystack who got their company acquired for 200 million dollars right so sometimes it might sound um materialistic but you got to throw the numbers out of people right you got to tell them look there's there's money there's money in africa there's there's a lot more money in africa if you play your cards right then there is over there yes you can it's there's a bit more comfort in a diaspora you know there's a bit more you know something you feel like things are sustainable although nothing is really, ever really promised but you know there's a bit more comfort but if you're willing to take that risk and you're willing to go to africa and invest in africa whatever country it is the the chances of going from zero to a millionaire is a lot higher in africa so if you're going purely from a financial perspective it's it for me i saw it as a be- better investment there's going to be challenges but for me it's a better investment but then also you're also thinking about you know your people right you're thinking about benefiting your community your your country your your tribe right so there's also that aspect as well so it depends on what you got to speak to the person personally and really try to understand you know socially what what they're passionate about are they passionate about making a lot of money are they passionate about improving their society their community what 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 is what is it that drives them and when you understand that either way it's a better bet in africa if you talk about money it's better in africa because you can make millions and millions of dollars in a short amount of time but then if you're talking about benefiting your community it's also better in africa because you can see the impact that you're having you know i was speaking to one of my colleagues the other day he started a an, an accelerator in nigeria and one of the the young men you know sent him a letter and he said it almost brought him to tears he said that the young man sent him a letter saying the other the other day i was working at chicken republic and for those of you that are not from nigeria there's a there's a, is a fast food place called chicken republic is a kind of like similar to kfc so the other day i was working for chicken republic but now i'm working as a tech developer for one of the largest banks in nigeria and he said look that's that's what i'm doing it for that's the impact you can see the impact right there So it depends on what the person is passionate about if it's impact it's it Africa if it's getting money quickly it's Africa so you just got to understand that there are challenges there's risks but if you want to take that risk if you want to make that jump i i honestly advise to invest in Africa thank you uh prince are you there you think you're muted Thank you so much Manabi Prince you're on mute. Sorry about that. Okay. It's happening. Uh I just didn't want to match on the back. Okay, thank you very much uh Malobi. That was very 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 insightful. Now, I'm just going to throw this out there and and leave the conversation to as many as are willing to jump in. Uh so and also from what the conversations you've been having. And also I was, I was talking to uh one of my team met the other time we in in July usually we always uh plan uh, economic summit and forums and so on you know and bring in various uh um, stakeholders you know to come discuss with the economy but we, it was it didn't happen this year and but then one of the focus i have right is to get organizations and companies you know and individuals and people like you who of course in the uh in the in the document or whatever it is they have a portion that talks about the csr they have a portion that talks about you know what they do for the community but in many cases like you said and I'm picking this from the point that you said that banks need to market their uh, uh, i don't know what word you use they need they need to to market the funds yeah they need to market their funds right we need to know that this is available right now but some of these organizations they are just there 
Uh, the habits and the talk, you probably go there, you see, no, we have these and so on. This is what we intend to do for the community and so on. But how do we know what's going on? You know, what are you doing for the community? How do we tap into it? What are the opportunities available for the community? You understand? I mean, you, this is such a huge company here in this community and so on. And then, but when you really sit and get to talk to them, they have very beautiful CSRO that if it is implemented, more than a thousand youth will get engaged, you know, and employed and what have you. But it's just word of the mouth, you understand? And I'm just, I'm throwing this question to everyone. And I also need you to please jump in, Malobi. You know, from what, from what you've seen, do you really think that companies in your community Right. Let's start from a small community. Are really doing enough in terms of meeting up with their CSRO? Are we really? Uh, how do we? How do we hold them accountable? You know, without also uh, scaring them off the out of the community. You understand? And how do we assess these opportunities that are there? Because that is the only way. If we have companies like these that are really doing well in that community and that you know, in, in these spaces, and they all provide such opportunity for us, it will really, really enhance, you know, and it's it's more of collaborative effort. These are doing this and so on, these are doing that. It's really, really will help. So guys, I'm just gonna ask if you have any, uh, maybe any experience of, you know, working uh, with a company and you are you have actually been able to tap into their CSRO and this, the, I mean, I mean, the corporate social responsibility. Let me put that there for, for those who need to clarity. I mean, and it's actually what the what companies do for the community that you operate in, right? And that is it. So if you actually uh, have been able to assess, you know, a company's opportunity, and I'm sorry, an opportunity provided by a company, you know, to develop and expand. This would like you to share with us and give us your experience. But if you have not, and that's the question to everyone, how do we find these things? You talked about marketing funds. How do we, where, where do we get to understand what database uh, is there for us to go and say, okay, fine, this organization is supposed to be doing one, two, three, four. So I can assess this from this organization, you know, as an individual in this community. And that's a question I'm just throwing out to the house there. And uh, Malobi, I don't know if you'll be able to maybe uh, throw some light on that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add, but um, yeah, I think a lot of sometimes, which is a shame, a lot of a lot of these CSRs and things are kind of um, virtual signaling and just you know things that companies do to you know just for for the sake of it, they're not really doing it to to really create an impact, which is sad. Um, but there are there are some companies that are actually making some impact. Um, it's 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 hard to really get them to commit to something if they're not really pushing it hard enough. I guess at some point as well, um, us within our own communities as well, we can see what we can do outside of what the companies are doing. Or if we can create a, a project that these companies are working or, or these companies are not working on, so you can create your own little cooperative, create a sustainable project, and then present it to these companies. Um, that's another way to go about it. But in terms of, you know, trying to get them to commit to certain things um, in the way that we want to, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but there are some companies that are doing some things, but there, there's, you know, a lot of them is just a lot of talk, you know. Um, you know, it, it's, it's like, oh, we, we do this, we're helping this. But when you look at it in, 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 in detail, you really see that the impact is not really there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it swings around about. I think, if, if people actually also take their own initiative and create these projects and maybe even start the project um, and then seek funding, then we might not have to rely so much on these corporations and companies and banks and financial institutions. So it's also on, on us as, as you know, individuals within society, within our communities to create these things and not wait for um, you know, institutions to make the change. Um, but yeah, it's it's, 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 it's two-sided, right? So it's accountability for them, trying to push them to do the right thing. But there's also us taking some accountability to create um, some sort of change within our community. So that's that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, does anyone has um, anything to quickly jump in uh, and just tell us how we can assess? All right, Cornelia. Yeah, um, this question get posed all the time. Where do we start? Where do we go to build up? In which direction? And I always say, you know, 
you must know what do you want? What do you really want? And when you can answer this question, what do you really want? You dot it down and you find the top companies, Google, I mean, when, when, when you guys, there's a lot of young people on today. Before it was really, really hard to find information. Now you guys can go into the internet and find it easier. Approach these companies. I am a woman of color in Europe. Do you know how difficult that was? You come from South Africa, a apartheid system that you lived in, and you end up in Europe and you realize, hey, girl, this is not such an easy thing to do, you know, to knock on a door and they look at you as if to say, what do we have here? Yeah. So you're not a white skin. We are Africans. Yeah. So what I did, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking from experience what I did. I knew what I wanted. I picked out the companies that I wanted to deal with and only the best. And I knocked on doors. And when the one door closed, I went to the next door. And when you start doing that, somebody will notice that you know what you want. You are willing to fight for your goal and your vision. And somebody will recognize that and will give you the opportunity to start. It is not easy. I'm telling you, it's not easy. Even African children who are German, who has been born here, they are still black. Their skin is still black. Even for them, it is very difficult to walk into a job market, to walk into any market here in Europe as well because of the color of their skin. This is real. This is very much alive. But if I talk about this issue, I don't just look at Europe. I don't just look at um, Africa. I look at us a whole as Africans. So when we know what we have, we have our goal. We have we know exactly where we want to head to. You follow, you, you stay focused and be disciplined. Be disciplined enough for yourself to say, you know what, I'm not going to give up. I will get what I want. And it doesn't matter what it will take me, I will get there. And believe you me, guys, it is not easy. Anybody, like someone has asked, uh, Sonia as well earlier, you know, how did you get there? How did you do that? Success is never easy. It is very hard. And I'm going to be lying to you if I'm going to tell you it's easy. It is hard work. But at the end of the day, you're going to do yourself proud and say, you know what? Look at this. I've done it. I've done it. I made myself proud and nobody else. So this is just uh, the little bit that I want to leave with you guys. There are a lot of young blood, a lot of innovators on this uh, conference today. And this is what makes me so excited being part of this conference as well, to realize, guys, go to your next mirror, look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm going to be the change. I'm going to make the change, not just for me, but for everyone else around me as well. And I'm Cornelia and I'm complete. You can hear yeah, I come from Clubhouse, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Cornelia. Um, that was a that was a very a very uh, beautiful one. And I was just you know it just also goes to remind me of uh, you know how you and I connected. And I could remember oftentimes when we you know when we talked uh, on like you just mentioned Clubhouse. I'm going to say that again. And uh, it was always a question of Prince, what do you want? You know. <laughs> <laughs> That was it. And then and there I was, you know, trying and after, after as soon as you caught the vision, it was always Prince, what do you want? You know, and 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 there I, I you know it's it's it really such a such a, um, a beautiful thing when you explain it right now. You know, when you're making these pitches to organizations, and that goes to everyone out there, you know, when you're talking to these people, like Colonia has said, be sure of what you want. 
if you're making a, co a connection here, be sure of what you want. When you're reaching out to somebody, be sure of what you want. Not everyone will accept you yet. I mean, you, you rightly said, you knock on doors, some doors are shut against you. You knock on doors, some doors are shut against you, but keep knocking. It's very important. I don't know if anyone would want to share with us an experience. I mean, uh, maybe, maybe uh, a sad experience, probably. I mean, uh, Cornelia just gave us a success story of, um, you know, how, your experience has been knocking on doors and with all the opportunities that you see available, but no door is opening. You know, um, it's very important for us to also have an understanding. We uh, have a lot of people here who are networking and also uh, looking to connect with you. And anyway, so have you been able, has anyone been able to really, really assess, you know, the opportunities that are provided by organizations in form of corporate social responsibility? Has anyone been able to? I'd like, uh, I'd like us to you know, have that conversation quickly, just for, for a few minutes. It's very, very important. If, if you're there, you, can, you may just raise up your hand and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, uh, it seems we are all good, <laughs> right? All right, thank you very much. Um, so I would have to give it back to, um, to Helen and we'll be taking a short break soon. Uh, but then I don't know, is Conscious still in the house? Conscious could just fill us in for the break. Is Conscious still in the house? If Conscious is in the house, um, we would like to give it to him. He was supposed to do the opening earlier, opening rendition. I think he's struggling with his connection. So please Conscious, if you are in the house, we will just want to give uh, a few minutes just for uh, a tea break and also get to hear uh, that beautiful uh, rendition that you have always fed us with and also helping our consciousness as well. Uh, conscious, if you're there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, conscious with struggling. I think uh, Cornelia, I can see Cornelia trying to reach out to Conscious. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I can see what you did in the background. All right. So if we get Conscious, and that's fine. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll have to move on. Uh, our next speaker also will be Cornelia. So I don't want to move her from one conversation to another already. I think we'll just have to take um, um, just um, five minutes break, and we can all reconvey here again at... Um, I don't know, whatever time it is right now, but half the hour, uh, that's about six minutes from my own time. So uh, in half an, in yeah, half the hour, we should be reconvening. It's 2.24 p.m. right now. So at 2.30, we can reconvene and take it up with, uh, with Cornelia. Uh, Cornelia is going to be telling us uh, from her experience and uh, how to build generational wealth uh, in, through property and uh, real estate investment. I mean, when I had a conversation, when I had a conversation with Cornelia and she gave a series of breakdown on how these things are really happening, I was, uh, I was amazed. And I felt, and I said, you know what? I'm really happy that I'm here with Cornelia and I'm really going to make, bring her here and let the whole world hear how you can build generational wealth. Thousands of young Africans are doing it and nobody is going to tell you about it. And that's why we are saying thank you, Cornelia, for, wish, for choosing to tell us about it, how we can build generational wealth. So thank you very much, guys. We'll all reconvene in five minutes. And um, it's Prince, as Cornelia has said, and I'm done speaking. <laughs> thank you. I'll see you all <laughs> in five minutes. Thank you, Prince. As Prince said, we're going to be on a break and we'll resume again at 2.30. That is um, South African time and that'll be 1.30 UK time. So we're on a short break for now and we'll see you again at, at 1.30 UK time. That'll be 12.30 in Ghana and 12, sorry, 2.30 in South Africa. So see you soon. And our, as um, Prince already said, our next guest speaker is Cornelia. Thank you so much. Can't wait. Bye-bye. Sorry, guys. Prince was just coming back. Uh, sorry. Um... Conscious is just back. He tried oh, to get connected. Yeah. Okay. Is he back? Yes. That's fine. Oh, he got thrown out again. Yeah, he'll open in the next session. It's fine. Okay. Hi. Um. Sorry. Quickly. Uh, if we're going on a break, do we have to shut down here? We don't really have to do that. You can just mute your 
you can just shut your cameras and go on a break and come back. Yes, yes you can... just shut your camera and then just mute yourselves. You don't have to exit and, and come back again.
Um, hello, everyone. We should be conveying. Um, I've gotten a couple of back channel messages requesting for an extra five minutes. Uh, and that's just <clears throat> so we've taken that five minutes. So may I just give another four minutes so we can all reconvey again and then uh, proceed to the next session. And in the meantime, may I request that uh, Conscious, please just set up your internet and be sure that you are ready to uh, to present to us, to give you, make your rendition before we leave the mic open for, for Cornelia. So Conscious, if you'd be so kind enough to just send me a uh, back channel, so I, 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 I'm sure that you're ready. I think that's you there. Okay, fine, I can see you. Um, yeah, so please get ready. You'll be, you'll be starting your rendition in three minutes. And it's okay if you decide to switch off your camera, we can hear you, okay? It's okay if your camera is off, just so you can have a, 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 a better uh, quality and connection as well. It's okay if your camera is off, just unmute your mic and give us a rendition. So you may start in, in three minutes and let us... Just to be sure, can you hear me? This is oh, conscious. Conscious, now I can hear you and I'm very sure every other person can. And uh, so, yes, I can hear you. Okay, I'll just be on the standby. I won't exit because I don't know what's going on. Maybe because I'm new, I'm not familiar with the apps. So, um, no you know, let me just be on the standby. No problem. Welcome to the 21st century. Um, <laughs> and I know you and you told me, you said you you're a producer and you're an engineer and so on. So don't worry. Welcome to Zoom, my friend. I think that's how it should be. Welcome to Zoom. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, please, you just have two minutes to prepare yourself. Like I said, this it's absolutely all right. It's perfect if you switch off your camera and your mic is on, so that it's uh, you don't have uh, you don't have to you know um, struggle with the connection. But if your connection is fine, then good. Would like to see your face see your smile and why you give us that rendition. Is that fine? I hope, I hope you can see my smile though. <laughs> I can see the smile, yeah, I can see the smile. It's smile, it's, the smile looks ready, you know? Oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so yes, thank you everyone for coming uh, back. Um, I can hello. See us all Yes, please. I hope you can you can see me now. Yes, Mr. Mr. K, I can see you and I can hear you. I can okay. see you. I wanted to find out if I wanted to find out if I wasn't going off because I was doing the sign language interpretation. I wanted to find out if um I wasn't going off. No, 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 yeah, you were perfect. You were not going off. You were perfect. Thank you very much. Such an amazing okay. thank, you. thank you. Welcome, boss. Okay. All right. So I'll go um. I will unmute my I will unmute myself and then uh, I'll meet myself and then we box on. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome, boss. All right. Um, so yeah, to everyone, we are ready. Cornelia, uh, you're going to unmute your mic soon, like we are, uh, like we do on Clubhouse, right? And then <laughs> and you start speaking. But um, that's just in just just uh, after. Conscious gives us his rendition. I mean, I've really been looking forward to this rendition that he's supposed to actually open for us. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I think there's a reason. I think he needs to usher you in. And that's why all this delay has come. I mean, for some reason, I don't know. Delay came and Conscious has to usher uh, Cornelia in. And uh, yeah, this is a very, this is the same Conscious and Cornelia bring the room together, singing and dancing. I remember yesterday, Cornelia, I'm just gonna, this is a gossip and I want the whole world to hear. After Conscious made his first rendition, Cornelia goes, you know, can I be greedy? We need more. <laughs> and that's so good. Thank you so much. So Conscious, um, over to you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you very much. I'm good to be here at the conference. Um, I'm happy and I'm proud of Africa. Um, I can see um, many young Africans here. It shows that um, Oh, we are about to change the narrative. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I go by the name Conscious Man. Um, I sing conscious music. Right now I reside in Nigeria, just Plateau State, and we are facing a lot of crisis, religious crisis, political crisis, and all kinds of crises, but God has been seeing us through. 
So um, yesterday we got engaged with the room and the room inspired this song since it is about African conference. I came up with this uh, song called Africa for Africans or Africans for Africa. Do have a, do have a happy listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, conscience. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And I'm, I really look forward to that song, uh, that album coming out. Please tell us about your album. You are compiling a couple of songs and you are planning to release them soon. Could you just tell us about your project, what you're doing, and yeah, and how we can connect with you? Okay, um, at the moment I'm working on a project um, album called My History. And one of the things that inspired the album is because the government in Nigeria decided to shut down history. And I think because of the shutting down of history in Nigeria, it has uh, brought a lot of controversy and a lot of problem in the country. Some youths feel that they have been marginalized because the House of Lani are taking advantage of them not knowing their history. You hear all kinds of things about not just knowing the history. A lot of youth today don't know their history. And for me, history is like our root, is who we are. I mean, it's the reason why we like identify ourselves and our nationality. Uh, I, I'll proudly say I'm a Nigerian. So if uh, I don't know, uh, about Nigeria, it means I don't know about myself because if I present myself as a Nigerian, people will ask us, yeah, tell, tell us about Nigeria. And if I don't know about Nigeria, then people will be like, ah, does this really a Nigerian? So for me, our history is who we are. So uh, the title track is My History. I'm actually working on 11 track song, I mean album. And for at the moment, I've released uh, one single title 
fake life because of the fake life we live in social media and all that is an interesting song you guys may want to check it out um i think that's that's all about the coming album thank you very much thank you and just just before i let you go and uh we um invite Cornelia in how can we reach out to you how can we connect with you you're doing such an amazing job let's hypothetically say i am also an artist and i really want to work with you or i'm someone who really has interest in music and i really really want to work with you how do i connect with you and yeah how can i get in touch with you okay at the moment you can get me on facebook as joshua Joel. Joshua Drell. Then on Instagram, I'm JJ. Joshua Drell, then in bracket JJ. Then you can also get me uh, on YouTube as JJ Baku. So I think through those mediums, you can be able to. But I will also will drop my um, number on the back door so that you guys can be able to get to me directly if you wish to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much uh, for, for your time. And thank you for that beautiful rendition as well. Um, yes, you've done so much and we appreciate you. Don't worry, we'll be able to connect with you when we need. And that's the beauty of it, guys. We need to actually start this networking and start this connection. Um, up next, we are going to invite Cornelia. We've actually, I mean, if you have not heard me say anything about her, you probably have just joined the program. Uh, <laughs> uh, so thank you and welcome, welcome to the conference. Uh, so Cornelia, would like you to just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, what you do. And I want that important part, the fact that you are a networker. All right, you have to add it to it as well. <laughs> as well. And also, yes, and uh, just explain to us how do we build generational wealth, you know, through property and real estate investment? Thank you, Colonia. Over to you. It depends now how much time I have. How much time do I have? <laughs> Can we start for can we start with 20 minutes for now and then okay. of course we're going to have questions and answers so yes please, yes yes of course i'll try to make it very short okay i will start with my journey for the second time back to europe and a, peop a lot of people are asking me you know what why do you do what you do yeah and I do what I do because I came back to Europe for the second time after 10 years after being at home. And um, when I came back, I, I thought, you know what, I've got all the um, paperwork, I've got all the certification, and then I can just walk into a job back here in Europe as well, because I do speak a little bit of German, so it's easy to do what I want to do. When I got here, I realized that the taxi drivers who were driving me after I asked them, and they asked me as well, so, hi, ma'am, where, where do you come from? I said, I come from South Africa. And then I asked them, so where do you come from? I come from different countries, they said. And I said, so what did you do back home? Yeah. And then they said, yeah, I was a doctor, I was an engineer, I was and all like really high profile jobs. And then this bugged me. And then I looked around and everywhere I went into the centers as well, I saw African people being cleaners everywhere here in Europe. And I said, excuse me, there's something here wrong with the system. And then I went around asking more questions. So what did you do back home in Africa? What did you do in another country before you came here? And they all gave me jobs and what 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 straight what the thing that went back to me i said hey i know africa in africa when you go study you have to pay for your study so that means even if your family don't have money the uncles and aunts throw money together so that you can have further studies 
and have a better education, you come back to Europe and you have to be a cleaner, you have to be a taxi driver, something is wrong with the system. So as I was asking the system, asking a lot of questions about what was happening here, I started making friends with more NGOs and more NGOs. And then the one NGO I walked into was Maisha in Frankfurt of Mine, run by a Nigerian uh, a woman from Kenya. And she was married to a German man before, had two kids, and uh, she had a lot of challenges. And she opened, this is why she opened the NGO as well. And I said to Virginia, I was very young at the time, I said to Virginia, Virginia, I don't know, you've been in this country for longer. What is happening here? What is happening? And then she said, I would like to introduce you to a woman from your country. And that is where the networking started. The real networking started. She introduced me to a woman called Wendy Elsner. She was a uh, exile for many, many years from Soweto in the Netherlands. And she said to me, girl, we've got to change this narrative. We as the African diaspora has worked very long and hard to change this story, what the Africans are going through here in Europe. And I think I'm going to show you how to network properly in different circles. And then you can also help the African diaspora who's currently there to change the narrative of what is happening in the EU and in this country. So that is where my networking all started. Mindful networking, going around, being around with the right people. When you do network, you have to start point one. Know what you want. When you go out around the different circles, don't steal someone's time. If you start talking to somebody and you know that this person cannot give you what you want, you move on to the next person. Now, I am part of a lot of networking events as well. And this woman has really taught me, Cornelia, when you start networking, you must really be mindful of how you network. When you on a, if you in a certain sector, you always have a group of people in one room, you target, even if you have an invitation list. Now, these, year, these years, we have it easier. You Google these people, you see what they're all about. So when you also go to the event, you don't waste your time when you start networking at an event. And this is, if you want to know how to network, to really be mindful about your time as well, how you invest your time in networking, I will leave my email address as well. I do uh, master classes about networking as well. And this is what it is. Coming back to an African woman, it was very, very difficult to walk into the job market. I do a man dominated job, which is real estate. And I also put special machines together with men. And I'm the only woman sometimes in one division. And my name is very German. So when people walk in, they expect a man and not a woman. So when you go into property as well, yeah, you walk in and uh, when they, the first thing when they open the door, they open the door to a black woman. And now the direction you have to go to is first educate your customer to say it is okay to do business with you. And then you move forward. The first thing you have to do when you start in the industry as well, you must know as an African man or African woman you are educated in this field, you know what you're doing and you are at your rightful place. If you have this in your whole aura and your mind already, there is nothing that can stand in your way. And Prince has asked me to talk about generational wealth and people always say, you know what? 
these rich people, they've got this properties, they've got that properties, they've got that properties. Do you know where I started with my first property in Cape Town? I was taught by somebody from the UK who was a millionaire, had loads of properties. He said to me, Cornelia, people always think you need a lot of money and you need big, big properties to invest in. You need a small property with the right address to start with. And I also do master classes on that. Yeah. My 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 communication to you guys is really broad. It's very large. So it will take a lot of time. And when you think of when you want to start building your wealth, don't go big, start small. Everybody else started small. Yeah. And when you start small, I'm looking, I'm talking now to the youth who's part of this conference today. Do you know where I started? I had a lot of pocket money. I had a lot of extra money that I got from my mother because she was a businesswoman. So she made us work as well. So if we wanted extra pocket money, so we had all these extra monies. What we did, we saved it. So you must learn how to go around and respect money first and then look after that money what you have don't go buy nike the best iphone that you can get and all those nonsense that is not going to bring you wealth everybody always asks me how did you do it there's a discipline in the everyday life as well that you need to adapt yourself to to get to that generational wealth it doesn't start with the big money your uncle might give us. Hey, please, we are Africans. We don't, we don't get money from our parents when they die. A lot of us, yeah? So we have to really work hard for our money. So what you need to work for is to have a clear credit record with a bank. If you have a clear credit record with a bank, then you don't even need your own money to buy your properties. Did you hear that really clear what I just said? If you have a clear credit record, this is where all the big fish has started. They don't buy with their own money. They go to the bank, they have a job, that pay them every month, they have a clear credit record, and this is how you start buying your first property and your second and your third. But you come to me for a masterclass and I can show you exactly how that get done. And at the end of the day, you will end up start building up your portfolio, buying in the right address. It don't have to be big. And from that, you can sell, you can keep it, you can play with the market as it goes up and down. A lot of people say, you know what, invest in crypto. I've been around people for the past two years who have more dollars on their account. What triggered me to hang around these people? I wanted to know how they really made their money. How did you guys make your money? And 90% of them didn't make their money from crypto, bitcoins and all this things that you have around. They all started making their money with properties. And the mean machine is like we work together as Africans. If you also have a good family that support you, try to get your family together to buy that first property as well. And when you start getting your close knit family to start buying your first property, that is where you start with your little steps with generational wealth as well we have people from africa living abroad and in africa at the moment my own family is doing they're buying properties and they're selling it to their own families at the end and this is what we're talking generational wealth these people were not capable of buying the properties their own relatives are buying it and showing them how to move that properties further.
yeah so if there are any any questions that you guys would like to ask us well when i uh, i didn't tell you how i got into properties um i got married and as i was saying earlier on um i come from a common commonwealth country and my certification was not um valid in in europe so what happened i had to wait a long long time to get my certification also um, valid, yeah? I had to do some courses and to get the stamp and all that, but that took a, a really a lot of years just to get there to, to, to have them certified. So I had to do something else to also uh, to, to educate myself, to earn some money. And what I did, because I was a property owner in South Africa, not in Germany, but in South Africa, I thought, you know what, you need to do a job. And this is where it comes to my conversation earlier on when I said, what do you want? What do you want? Stay focused. What is your goal? So I looked at the African community around me. They're cleaning everywhere, buildings, toilets. This is reality. They are uh, driving a taxi. And I said, I didn't come to Europe to clean someone else's toilet. My mother worked really hard so that we can all have an education. What I did, I found a international real estate agent around the corner. When I walked in, my German was really not so good. I walked in and um, I asked, where's the owner? So I said to the owner, I'm Cornelia and blah, blah, blah. Um, or do you have space for people to, uh, to do a practical in your company? And he first looked at me and he said, uh, hmm, I'm not too sure. I said, yes, I know you guys are dealing with properties and monies and all that, but are you willing to give me a chance? So he looked at me first and he was like, you're coming from South Africa. I've dealt with women and men like you already from your country, but with a different skin color, yeah? like whites from South Africa. So I thought to myself, oh man, is he gonna give me now another long story? So what he did, he didn't close the door on me. He gave me a chance. He had a long conversation with me and then he realized this woman can sell. So from this minute that he realized that I could sell, he educated me, he said to me, listen here, I'm gonna stand behind you. It's not gonna be easy. It's going to be difficult. There are professional people here. We are at that time, 30 real estate agents, people who are making real money. And here this African woman is walking in who don't have a clue about real estate. So this man gave me a chance and I grabbed that chance. It was difficult. There was many days I was like, what did you get yourself into? But I thank God every day that this person gave me a chance. I didn't stop when people closed the door. I went ahead. I had time for my family. My child was on school and I earned some good money. So this is why I always ask you, you must know what you want and go after what you want. And this is how I got into real estate. And then I built the trust with my customers. First, in the beginning, I didn't even, they didn't even understand sometimes what I was saying, the communication that we had together, but they accepted me as a person. And this is one thing that I have to leave with you guys as well. Whatever you do, don't change yourself for anybody. Don't do someone else. Just do you. Just do you and be true to yourself and respect the person you're dealing with. And you can never go wrong in life never and this is yeah this is where i'm going to stop and prince is there any questions or to anybody in the audience as well who would like to ask me about anything because i took a little bit of a dash of this and a dash of that today all right thank you very much uh okay yeah thank you very much cornelia that was uh, that was beautiful uh, i'm just going to leave the room open for questions uh comments and contributions and so on. But I'm just, let me throw this question to you. If there's anyone who has a question, okay, fine. I see a Tony, I see Joshua, fine. Uh, so I'm going to take their questions, okay? And uh, we can answer them together. My question to you is, 
you you are in Germany, right? Good. And looking at Germany and looking at South Africa or Africa, I know you have an understanding of the African landscape in terms of uh, real estate and so on. Now, looking at this, where do you do you encourage young Africans to invest in property outside Africa or inside Africa or a little bit of both? I mean, you said your first property was in Cape Town. Um, I might just really want to have an interest and say, you know what, I think I think I want to have a house in Germany, but it's actually uh, not a residential one. It's not where I want to live in, but or I want to have a house in South Africa or somewhere in Nigeria. From the real estate markets across the globe and looking at Africa, where do you really see so much hope, promising hope and such a bright future? Uh, that's, that's question one. And um, I'm going to ask... Uh, I just asked you to, uh, I think it's Joshua, to please just ask your next question and then we can put that together and then leave it to uh, to Cornelia. So please just take note of that first question. Where do you think, where can, will you advise and where do you see the future of real estate going? Um, Joshua? Yeah, um, I want to ask this question because um, I've been in the showbiz business. I, I'm not the government, government kind of worker. I, I've run my studio, like doing video studio. I, and I earn good money. I've been renting house for, I think this is almost uh, 10 years now. And I've thought about having my own house. Whenever I think of like going to the bank, I don't see like, uh, it's gonna happen for me because I I only bank with the bank. I don't have a salary account. I only get my money and just bank it in the bank. So someone like me, if you like, really wanna access access a loan and maybe invest into property, how do you go about that? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And um, attorney. Hi, Cornelia, thank you so much um, for your session. So I've got two questions. And um, the first one, as you mentioned, when we start investing in property, we must start small. So um, the aim is not to go for the, the big guns per se at the beginning. So what would you define as small? That's the first question. And then the second question is, um, you know, sometimes in Africa, when you're growing up and stuff, so um, I think you mentioned that your family would be the ones that put you through school. And from them, what the expectation is, is that once they've put you through school, the money and the salary that you begin to earn, you must plow it back to them. Um, so what we would call black tax. How do you deal with that sort of situation where instead of you being able to build, you're expected to now take your siblings to school, people behind you, younger ones to school and sort of um, build and replenish and pay back the people who have put you through school and have given you the platform? Okay, so thank you, Cornelia. Um, those are questions for you. I'm, I'm sure you took note of them, right? Yeah, your, your first question, I will go with you first. Um, your first question about property buying in Europe or someone else. Uh, I would not buy property in Europe. <laughs> Africa, if you know, I've, I've, I've been living in many places already and in Europe as well. And if I look at the spaces and the places where you want to live and... Um, Yes, Cape Town is expensive. You will get the same amount of cost as well, but bigger grounds. Yeah, the, the costs will be more or less the same, but the properties are bigger. The only thing that you are living in, which is a difference between here and there, and that is also not everywhere in Europe and in Germany, there are some areas where you can also not just leave your door open where you also must have uh, proper security and 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 i've lived in many places where you can leave your car open your doors open nothing will happen yeah so you cannot really look from a security point of view is it safer in europe or is it safer in africa if you buy in good areas anywhere in africa you still make a better buck and you create a better space for your children and grandchildren to live in, yeah? Uh, property market, 
from if, if if i look at property back here it is extremely expensive i always say when i look at a small masonet and you guys know what a small masonet is in africa yeah you cannot even turn yourself around and i'm 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 a I'm an African woman as I'm I'm not slim, yeah. So I want to be able to move myself around in my own four walls as well. And these places you cannot move yourself around because it's really too small. It's wasted for me, it's wasted money. You can go buy in Africa, it's better. Uh, that's answer your question. It's don't waste your money to do that. It's hard work money, don't do that. Um the other thing to Joshua's question, I've, I've, I've known a, quite a few people were in the same situation like Joshua and what they have done, they've gone out to get people who I can't have hear money. you. Yo, the voice Did you guys off. hear me before? Okay, yeah, I, I can, can hear you. you. I'm hearing you before, but now we can hear you too. Okay. Uh, Joshua, your your question. Uh, I've I, I've met quite a few people who have have a problem like yours, where they rent and rent and rent for a large amount of money every month. Yours is already ten years, so if you calculate up all that money, that is a hell of a lot of money that you paid for rent already. Yeah. What a lot of people are doing, they go out and try to find somebody who are credible, who you can trust, somebody you know. And then you say, you know what, um, if anything happens, this is yours and that is yours. If you can buy for me, I have a hold of, I've, I've got a brother who did that as well. The house is paid off long ago. It was also a friend of his. I know a few other people as well who has done that. We, someone else buy on behalf of you yeah you can also uh do even if you want to go into properties but you have to start educating yourself doing that and that is where carol comes in carol is not online at the moment but she will be joining in here a little bit later she does a lot of properties she re-rent them but it doesn't belong to her, it belongs to other people. So there are people who have flats and properties. So you start building up your capital in one way, you take the flat, you furnish them and you re-rent them, but you're not the owner, yeah? So this kind of structures, um, if you reach out to me and Carol, we can show you exactly how it gets done as well. Yeah, there is a way to get out of it. You just have to find the right person to trust you enough, who know you long enough as well to do that. Does that answer your question, Joshua? Yeah, very well, thank you. Because that's basically the only way to get out of it. You know, uh, a lot of foreigners here in Germany, they do have that problem. Uh, they do have jobs but the jobs pay, the rent can also pay the bond. And they also get, sometimes they get Germans to take up the bond for them and they pay the people back. And then at the end of the day, the property is theirs. This is what happens back here as well. So there are some good people around as well. You know, it's not all that, it's all not all that bad. You just need to find the right people. Uh, the next uh, question to, um, yeah. <laughs> The black tax, <laughs> I've heard this in my room the other day. Somebody said, Cornelia, you know, our parents and our family, they pay for our school and all that, you know? So um, I would like the person to rephrase the question exactly what she wanted from me. Is that what kind of property you buy at the end of the day uh, to, I, I didn't understand the question quite well. The last person who posed that question. Okay, sorry. So the it was two questions. So the first question is, 
you mentioned that when we start investing in property, we must start small and um, we mustn't necessarily go for like the big houses and your Santons, you know, if you're from South Africa. So the first question is, in terms of starting small, what are we looking at? Are we looking at maybe like 500K, a million, 1.5? So what what sort of bracket or what, what should we be considering when we're thinking of starting small? So that's the first question. Can I first um, ask, can I first answer your first question? No your problem. first question, I would say, always know your numbers. What can you afford? You'll always hear people asking you, how much do you have? How much can you afford? And when I say, I don't say you must stay away from the Santon, yeah? You know what I did my first property in Cape Town? I bought in a very expensive area, but it was a very small property. And I knew when I bought that property, in two, three years, it's going to be three times the amount of money. So don't stay away from Santon. Go into Santon, find the smaller properties, even if it's a flat that is available. A lot of people who has made their money with uh, properties as well, they didn't go for the brand new flat sets on the market. You know, it's South Africa. You have such a lot of people outside who can do the work for you. So what happens? They buy grotty flats that nobody wants to renovate and they make their money on a flat like that. They get the cousins and the brothers and whatever to do the painting and to do what all the renovating. And at the end of the day, a lot of my friends has done that. And even my European friends has done that in South Africa, in Cape Town uh, for, for such way. People didn't want to buy these places which they bought. They bought it, they renovated themselves, and they've even sold it for five or six times more for what they bought it from. And this is where it starts. This is where you start making your money work for you. Buy those grotty properties, but also know your numbers. Also know how much are you going to give out for this uh, renovation? Are you going to be bringing people in to do the renovation? Is my cousin or my uncle or my whoever around me, my boyfriend, my husband, whatever, going to do this renovation so that we can get a cheaper deal? We only have to pay, pay for the materials. And if you can think like that, then you go into property. But if you think of just having this luxury apartment and paying a lot of money for, you're gonna, never going to make money because you're going to pay on top and on top and on top because the levies is high, this is high, that is high. So you always have to think of, you need to know your numbers. You need to work around the cost. What can I afford? Where do I cut down? That and that and that. This is how you have to work with properties, you know? And this is how everybody is doing it, not just in Germany, not just in South Africa, around the world, people are dealing like that with properties, putting hands on for their first. So don't stay away with Santon. I'm not going to tell you to stay away with Santon. The next question was uh, what? The second yeah. one? Yeah, so the next question was, so, I mean, in terms of earning our salaries and what we, the dispensable income or disposable income that we have, so when we do earn or when we still do start becoming professionals, our families expect us to put our siblings through school or they expect us to now start building back at home or, you know, plowing back into the community that raised us. So how do we save money? How do we start investing when most of our money has to go towards um, black tax or has to go towards, you know, taking our young younger siblings through school and things like that? I cannot even answer your, 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 your question because if I'm going to answer your question, it's going to be very wrong. I've never been in a position like where you are. This question has been posed to me quite a few times in my room as well. Cornelia, how do we get away from this black tax? It's something that we don't really want. You know, my idea is I'm a parent. It's my duty to, to finance my child, to get them through the school, to get them further in life. It is not my duty to want the money back from them. So I cannot even answer you that question. I, 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 I was not in a position like that. My parents didn't... Um, 
want that from me. They didn't expect me, not up till today. Uh, I see many Africans living here, they're living like paupers. Most of their money gets sent into Africa because the family are pressurizing them to send that monies back. I don't have that problem. So I cannot even answer you that question. It will be very irrespect disrespectful to you as a person and for me to even allow myself to answer you that question. Is that okay? Um, yes, that's fine. I appreciate the honesty and frankness. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. And um, if you guys, you have, uh, I've been on screen for a while. Have you noticed something in this picture, what you see right now? Anybody? The shelves, the files. You spoke to me on Clubber, so you should not answer, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? You guys have seen me on the screen earlier on. You change location? You change your outfits and your location? The outfit, yeah, and the location. Okay, I just want to give a quick, quick, quick saying about that, okay? Now, when you an African and you, uh, some of you might just uh, say, you know what, I'm a traveler. I would like to experience Europe as well. I would like to experience another country. It, uh, it don't have to be Europe as well. It could be even another African country. Show up. You asked me to talk about work. You asked me to talk about real estate. So what I did, I changed my part to talk to you as well. So if you can have this mindset to show up for your customers as well, and for those you are dealing with in your different professions. When I started real estate, I had two suits, that played the part, the way I show up for my customers. And I wore just those. So it's in very, very, very important as well, how you show, it don't have to be expensive. It don't have to be name brands, but very important how you show up for the people that you work with. And that is rule number one. And I'm Cornelia and I'm complete for now. Uh, am I on mute? Okay, now can everyone hear me? So please, if there are any questions, we would need to would like to take them now, and uh, yes, and just engage Cornelia. Are you interested in property, and do you really want to get an understanding of how it works and how you can build generational wealth? I mean, uh, Cornelia, from when you were talking, are you actually you said? something around, I mean, from the examples you kept giving, I could see that one of, and I stand to be corrected, that one of the best uh, sectors to actually partner or collaborate with in terms of uh, uh, real estate is the banking and finance. And also during the conversation earlier, uh, when uh, Manobi was also talking about uh, agriculture and agrotech in Africa and the opportunities that are there as well, and the same opportunity that they are also providing, um, we could also link it to the banking and finance, you know, how important it is for the banking sector to come on board as well. Uh, but it seems as if we understand the importance, of course, everything revolves around money. And uh, even as a religious person, even the Bible says money answered all things, you know. <laughs> and so, and um, I think I was in a room yesterday and somebody actually reminded me of an old saying, which actually really uh, resonated with me and said, he who funds you controls you. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, and if you, if you look at all these, the banking, the banking uh, sector is very, very important in terms of transforming economies and so on and so forth. But what, are, what other sectors are we looking at, you know, that could partner and also be able to provide more opportunities for the real estate. If we talk about the agricultural sector, we know it's to plant and whatever it is now. But 
60% of Africa's land, from what I know, you know, is arable and people can use for farming. The other 40% could be split across, across um, every other thing. Now, in terms of property, is it, if I have the resources, would you advise me to build my property from scratch? You know, build my own property from scratch, you know, and build it the way I want it? Or would you advise me to buy, to buy property? And uh, looking at sustainability as well. And what other sectors do you think we can partner with? Aside the banking sector to actually enhance the property, the real estate sector. And sorry, I also see that um, Helen, your hand is up. So, Helen, if you would please just um, ask your next question and so that Cornelia can take both of them. Yes, Cornelia, I just wanted to ask you about the high interest rates in um, Africa, especially Ghana. You know, they expect you to put down a 30% deposit if you, you know, obviously you're not paying outright. The high interest rate, is there any other? organizations that you might know that help finance people trying to buy or get into the property market. Um, if you can highlight that for me, thank you. I do know, Helen, I do know uh, quite a few real estate agents in Ghana. I will leave my um, email address with you as well to please reach out to me uh, directly because I'm not gonna give you the wrong answers. What is happening, what I know is happening right now uh, around uh, the diaspora as well, basically really the diaspora uh, from all over here, Africans are funding, really Africans, yeah? So there are quite a few um, organizations, uh, businessmen who have been living here and making good monies here in Europe as well, we're saying, you know what, we don't need the banks. We don't need all these uh, different entities, yeah? At the end of the day, our people are poorer. We are here to fund our own people. And this is really happening. I am on this crazy platform every single day and I see it happening in front of my eyes. So if you reach out to me, I can link to you to the right people. I'm not going to give you the wrong advice. And this is some, this is again, this, this, this 30%, you know, if you can break down that 30% and you can get somebody to fund you with a 10% or the 15%, and then you only have to pay the 15%. And this is what we're talking about. The, there are a lot of Africans who are doing that right now, um, who are saying, you know what, Helen, you really want to buy that property. What do you have? What do you have to bring to the table? Let's help you. Let's move this, you know, because at the end of the day, well, this is how we are building our continent. We are not building it for anybody else, but for us and our children. So Ghana, I am uh, very much aware that Ghana is very expensive with properties. But I always say, people, I come from Cape Town. When I look at 30 years ago, what I paid for rental, in Cape Town, and I came here to Germany, I've lived in the same size place, I paid exactly the same amount of money. And that's, and, and I don't know how the Africans are sometimes even paying for it, yeah? So um, there is a crack to do that as well. There's something that I have to say to everybody who's listening to me today. Sometimes it all looks very, impossible. You know that word impossible? I want you all to write it down and write it through in the I'm and put that in the dirt bin and make that word impossible my possibilities today. So a lot of people laughed at me when I said I want to do this, I want to do that. So how are you going to do that? I stayed focused. I knew what I wanted and I let myself get educated by the best. And this is how I moved on. So Helen, if you want to get to that first property with that 30%, 30% is not much, yeah? We can also get around that 30%. So I will leave my uh, email address uh, in here as well and please reach out to me so that we can get over that hurdle as well. Thank you so much, Connie. That was brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. 
what you said. Sorry, um, Prince, I, I will just chime in a little bit. I just love what you said about getting rid of the impossibilities because that's the thing, the, us in the diaspora, who want to go back, it's that impossibility and knowing who to, you know, who to be able to help us when we want to make that decision to go back. You know, so I really love what you said about taking away that, in, that word impossibility because things are possible, you know? And I think also networking with the right people back home as well. Um, and not looking at the problems, try and look at the solutions. You know, we know that corruption goes there. We know these things. We know the mindset is there, but look at the solution. What can we offer? So thank you so much for that. That's brilliant. And I just want to leave you guys with that as well. You know, we all want to go back. I don't want to grow old here. Yeah? I'm already a grandmother, yeah? So I don't want to really grow old here yeah, in, in Europe. I want to go back to Africa and just enjoy it, you know? So um, I don't find the space here. Yeah. If I see how the old people are getting old here, yeah, I think, no way, I'm from Africa. I don't want to be here. Yeah. So, um, guys, we all were living outside in the UK and wherever. We are all working our way back to Africa again. But like I say, you have to surround yourself with the right people. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Um... Thank you guys. And uh, first of all, thank you so much to Cornelia for that beautiful session. Um, I don't know if anyone has any question again, why we just take the, run the uh, last um, set of questions as we round up. Would you please just raise your hands if you have any question, we are ready to take them and then we'll move to uh, the next session as well. Any Hi, Prince says, sorry, Prince, there is a question. It said some from, um, I think it's Asanda. Um, she asked, are, are there any uh, master classes? That's what Cornelia, are there any master classes that you're running in the chat? Yes, I am. Okay. Is Asanda looking to buy uh, some properties in South Africa? I'm going to join her to do that. A Sunday is in South Africa. She's in Belgium, isn't she? I think she replied always. All right, thank our, you. Heart, our heart is in Africa. So we all <laughs> thinking property back into Africa as well. No place to leave our money in Europe. I'm sorry. Africa for Africa. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, that's really very important for, for us to understand the importance of not just investing in Africa, but also understanding the, land, the landscape as well. Uh, so thank you, Cornelia. It's really uh, nice having you here. Um, I don't know if any other person has any question. Let's just take that and then we can uh, move to, to the next session. Um, the other session, first of all, we'll be having uh, Mr. Gochuku Chidibiri, and he, he's just back telling me now that he's in transit. So, but however, rather, he has actually sent us his, sent his presentation already, you know? So that's really a very good one. And um, so I'll be putting on his presentation. It's just about 15 minutes. And when he comes on live, we will be um, ready to take his questions and comment and, 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 and contribution as well. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you please just, uh, I'm just gonna give two minutes or rather 50, uh, 50 seconds for anyone who has any questions to really jump in now um, before I share the screen. Prince, hi, sorry. Um, Na, um, I invited you, also said, um, Cornelia, thank you so much. That was very insightful. It was brilliant, thank you. Sorry, Prince. Friends up, I hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, right. Mrs. Na. Right. Thank you so much, um, Helen. So if anyone has any question, please drop your questions now. Like I said, I'm leaving about um, 60 seconds for us to uh, you know, think about whatever you want to ask. And then I'll just set the screen to play Mr. Malobi's presentation. 
All right. Uh, and also, we are, we are also having some, uh, not, some uh, okay, Asanda, are you raising your hand again or am I just saying it now? Uh, somebody's about to join the room, a, a very important person as well. He's one of our speakers tomorrow, Mr. Williams Jackson. Um, okay, I'll just admit him in and maybe just allow him make um, a hello and an introduction. But yeah, Asanda, I see your hands up. So, yeah. Good afternoon, it's Asanda speaking. My question to Cornelius is, could you please explain a bit clearer why the bank is actually a good collaboration? Because I think as Africans, we've been burnt and have different relationships with banks. And we think they're their enemy, but they're actually part of our collaboration. I'd love you to express that a little bit more, how the bank can help them uh, create uh, better investments in property. Thank you, as I started speaking. If you, good to see you, Queen. I always just see you on the audio app, cool. This is live with Sebastian and everybody else that I know from somewhere else. Joshua, great seeing you guys here live. Yes, um, the thing is, do you know what? If you pay rent, you pay maybe a thousand euros for rent and you go to the bank and you have a clear record at the bank and you pay for the monthly rate, maybe 600 or 650, what did you save? you save quite a bit of money and that's your cash. Yeah. So you have to look at um, using someone else's money. You don't have that money to buy your properties. Where do you have that money to buy your properties? Everybody else use the money from the bank. We dealing with machines, you know what we do? We could buy that machine's cash, but why should we do that? We don't buy that machine cash. We use the bank. We buy that machine over the bank. So you pay a very little bit of money to the bank every month. And in the due time, that machine is yours. And this is what I'm talking about. People don't think in that way. If you look at a Prince's case, He's paying, a princess just gave me a memory of when I was living in Tamburskloof in Cape Town many, many years ago. When I looked at, this is one of the things that has driven me to buy my first property as well. When I looked at how much money I paid for that one year for rent and what the bank could give me and what I paid to the bank, I saved so much money every single month and the property was mine. So this, we have to start having a different kind of mindset when we uh, think properties. If we don't think a different kind of mindset, there will be a lot of people who will say to you, oh yeah, you know what? The banks are actually your enemies. They are actually not your enemies. There are a lot of people who are buying with a bank's money. And if you think like this, like me, you are going to have fun buying properties because if you buy at the right uh, address as well, you can turn, you can flip that property around and say, do you know what? This is what I've done as well. In two, three years, I'm in a good space. I want to buy something bigger. Yeah. And then you flip that property around, you sell it because you made quite a bit on that. Your property is paid for and you can use that even to buy another property so this is how you have to think when you think of properties it's actually not that impossible it's quite simple come to a master class with me i can show you how to do it it's not difficult it's really not difficult but to give you a rundown on how to do it here yeah, it's going to take very long and prince is going to throw me out <laughs> so we can do a masterclass uh, in our regular room as well. I'm very happy to do that with, yeah, I'm very happy to do, to run a room on that with Carol as well and show you exactly how to move it from Europe to Africa. Okay. Banks are not your enemy. Use their money. 
Prince, I know you're gonna you're gonna shoot me, but please let me ask one more question. I'm sorry, I'm so have to ask this. <laughs> this is so insightful. We know we can't get Cornelia like this. <laughs> so please, let's make use of it. Cornelia, I just want to ask you if you have really bad credit and you're coming from the diaspora. You know, I know you said you have other organizations that can help, but it's normally okay if you have good credit, we can help you. What is there for people who have really bad credit? And especially for the youth as well, who may be starting saving, because I have a daughter who started to save and she's looking to buy something in UK. So I can maybe prompt her to say, okay, let's invest in, you know, Ghana, you know? Um, so is there anything there available for bad credit, is, uh, if possible? Can I tell you what? My best friend is Vietnamese. I'm around the Asian people are a lot. And I've seen how the Asian people has been doing it. They're all also part of the diaspora like we are, yeah? And a lot of diaspora because of what life throws at all of us, some of us get into bad credit. So what a lot of them has done, the children are getting older like yours, they have saved some money and they let the daughter or the son buy the property. That is how the Vietnamese do it. That is how the Chinese do it. That is how the Asian people are doing it. Yeah. And why can't we learn from other people who is doing actually the same? A lot of foreigners are doing the same. They are using their children, putting the monies into their accounts because they have a clear credit and say, listen here. Yeah, you buy the property, the property I own, I pay for it, but you buy it. This is what everybody else do it. What stops you from not doing it? What stops you from doing it? Because, you know, there are many situations and my, many of us didn't ask to come into. It is just part of a life being in a, in a different country sometimes. Things happen, then you get into a bad credit. So when you have children or even cousins or whoever, let them buy that property on their name. Why not? You make a clear paperwork as well with your attorney at the end of the day. If you don't uh, think this is going to be good, yeah, you do a, a good paperwork with a good attorney and put the things in black and white that it's very clear, the conversation is clear because anything that's got to do with money could be a problem at the end of the day. So let that message be clear on black and white, and then you have your property as well. Did that, did I answer you? Yes, because of time, let me, because <laughs> I don't want to shoot the prince. Get in contact you. with me, Helen. I we can see. show you how to get out of that rut. Yes, women empowerment, women empowerment. <laughs> Guys, I'm actually enjoying the session, and uh, yes, <laughs> um, don't worry, uh, Helen. I am not going to cut your chop your neck your neck off. Don't worry. We're asking the question. That is why we are actually here. Just yeah, just to be able to connect, just to be able to understand. And she, um, Cornelia, has talked about master classes. So Cornelia, yeah, there's a question in this section. How much are your master classes? Do you charge for them? How do we reach out to you? You said we should send you an email. Please drop it in the chat session. But um, what's the average cost uh, of your master classes? You're talking about money to me in a in a Zoom call, Prince. What kind of businesswoman do you think I am to talk money in a Zoom call? There's just no way I'm going to be doing that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I. <laughs> Prince, I saw it and I ignored it. I looked at it and I said, there's no way I'm going to say that one out. <laughs> Cornel oh, Cornelia, gosh, now, now be nice, Cornelia. <laughs> I am very, very nice, Sebastian. I'm a very nice woman, don't you? Don't even try to tell me I'm not nice. I'm so, it's so cool to see you guys. I'm in conversation with you guys like every day and I see you interact. This is so cool. Oh. So, um, that question is from Atoni. So please um, just reach out to Cornelia. She will drop her email address and then you can always connect. I did, but he doesn't accept it. Okay. Uh, it please. is private. 
Oh, you can change the setting there to, uh, to send to everyone. And, or you can just always send it to me in a back channel and I'll, I'll, I'll share it to the, to the um, general house. So I think this, we can- This is not Clubhouse, there's no back channel. <laughs> what, what do you call it now, from DMs? Uh? On this app is called a chat. Oh, on a chat. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. See why we need people like Sebastian in the house. Uh, <laughs> they are tech gurus. I mean, he actually is uh, one of those who made some of these connections really possible for us. Thank you very much, Sebastian. It's good to have you. Um, okay, in the absence of any other question, um, I just want to think, believe there is no other question. If you have any other question, please let's quickly jump, uh, drop it in. I will um, want to uh, introduce Mr. Gochuku or Beche. Like I said, he's currently not around, but um, we are going to uh, play his presentation that he has sent to us, and then uh, maybe open it to, to conversation before he jump in uh, and uh, come, you know, answer our questions as well. So, thank Prince, you. Uh, sorry, Prince, can I just uh, ask you, Carol is online, yeah? She is the other property uh, real estate from the UK. She also have just a few tips. She won't take a lot of your time. Just a few tips for you guys as well. Beautiful. I mean, I actually did it. Thank you very much because I know, I know Carol and I actually didn't know that she actually is with us here. Uh, with us here. So yes, Carol, thank you very much for joining us. Um, please, may I, quick, may I please ask that you just unmute your mic and tell us uh, something that we need to, you know, something about property as well. And just before that, we have uh, Mr. Williams Jackson. Uh, he's here, you can see his message on the back channel. He's actually joined us from the United States. He is one of our speakers tomorrow who is going to be talking about training and leadership. And uh, I mean, uh, we are really looking forward to having him uh, join us tomorrow. Uh, so, Mr. Jackson, if you just want to say hello, uh, you're welcome to just say hi to everyone. So we we look forward. We actually have an idea of what you look at, look, what you look like, and you know, <laughs> so we can come ready tomorrow. <laughs> yes, uh, thank Mr. you, Jackson. If you can, uh, could you just just quickly say hello? Um, okay. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you right. Good. I just wanted to say good. Well, good morning from the United States of America. I'm William Jackson. Um, I am a STEAM teacher that science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And I also have a technology business where I blog and speak about technology integration and empowering young people how to use technology to grow a business and to expand their voice digitally. And I'm looking forward to speaking more tomorrow. But thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, yes, thank sir. you very much. Um, um, Mr. Mr. Jackson, it's so good to have you here and we're looking forward to having you tomorrow. Um, I'm actually looking forward to your session because um, you are going to, you know, really talk about leadership and how we can structure it in the future in Africa. I mean, it's something we really, really, really need to build and, and talk about. Uh, so we're looking forward to having you tomorrow, uh, as well as one of our other guests as well, Mr. Amoyele Shore. So I, I mean, tomorrow is going to be such an, such an, uh, an amazing and interesting session having you uh, on the show. So it's, it's actually a privilege. And we say thank you for reaching out to us and thank you for staying with us. And uh, even with all the communication and everything, you've actually still also stayed true. So thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. It's good to have you here. Um, so, um, Carol, are you ready to to join us now? Yes, I am. I am. Can you hear me? Right. Yes. I'm going to try and come online. I don't know if you can see me, but yes, I think you can. I saw my face there a minute ago. Right. So, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Sorry, I've had a bit of a hectic. Uh, hectic time. It was just a, a minor emergency, as it is with any kind of landlord. So I'm sorry, I don't really know what the discussion was all about. But with regards to property, I did come in when Cornelia was talking about her ma the master class, and I think in that we can um, uh, further expand. You know, all about property, how you can. Um, at actually make money with property with little or no uh, of your no none of your own money so there are these strategies that will work in England I don't know how we could take it across 
um, to Africa, but that will need to be investigated. But what we're trying to do um, is really kind of encourage um, people to start on the property ladder. I heard somebody, I'm not quite sure who it was, um, talking about her daughter and her credit history. Um, and maybe that is just something that I will deal with um, very briefly. So when you go into property, unfortunately, credit history is a very, very important thing, which you're gonna to go to the banks and they're going to assess your credit worthiness um, to whether they're going to give you money or whether they want to give you money or not. And there's loads of people that will give you money, but you will pay um, a very, very high price for it. If you want to make the numbers work, then the best credit to get is probably good. So if your interest rate is low, your cash flow will be higher. And so it's a good idea to get your credit history um, up to scratch. Um, and uh, we can talk more about how that is done if anybody needs to know how it's done. Um, but there is some simple steps that you can take to improve one's credit history. And as um, I, I think that probably is all that I have to say, but you know, property is a great, myself, by way of introduction, I started um, investing in property a very long time ago, 20 plus years ago. And the beauty of property is that it's afforded me um, to look after my kids. I didn't, I traveled um, and I have the flexibility of being a mum to stay at home and also to work. So um, for uh, parents um, and mothers um, and young people, it's a fantastic flexible vehicle of making a considerable um, income while still having the flexibility to travel um, or to do the things that you want to do or to spend time with the people you like spending time with, i.e. your family. So I'm happy to answer any questions, um, if we could just make them brief, because I've read we don't have a lot of time, but we will cover things in greater detail in the masterclass that Cornelia has put together, but maybe we should try and get um, some more clarity around that and let everybody know. So please send us um, a message and we can connect you with the type of programs that we are looking at for the masterclass to explain strategies, how to improve credit history and how to start with little money. Okay, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer one or two. All right, thank you so much, Carol. Um, it's good to have you. And also it's good to finally see you again. I mean, it's been weeks talking and not seeing who I am talking to. So it's good to see you here. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I really want to say, I mean, you're doing such an amazing job in the property sector. And, um, you know, from all that, you know, all I, uh, that actually you, you do talk about when we are in the room together, you know, and having these conversations, you actually do really um, expose us, you know, to the opportunities that are there, you know, to, and um, give us a, a very good understanding. So I must say thank you, and you're doing such a great job there. And uh, yeah, it's good to finally see you, and it's good to have you here. I don't know if anyone has a question, please, would you please just ask the question? Um, Carol, you said something about, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, first, I'm not very good at maths, and so when you say anything that has to do with income and, you know, up and down, I start getting confused. But then, <laughs> but you said, um, you actually said something about having, if you have a lower income and um, the interest rate is high or a higher income, I mean, I want to go. But, okay, so let's say, for instance, there's an example that you want to, to borrow some money, but you've got a poor credit rating. So the people that will give you money are uh, people that are going to take um, a gamble on the fact you might possibly need, you possibly might default. So they will building, the underwriters will charge you much more. So as opposed to 1%, 2% or 2.5%, they might charge you 5 or 6 or 7. That will uh, um, impact your bottom line. So if you're going to pay uh, mortgage payments of £200 and with this increased interest rate, you are going to pay £400 and your rental, for instance, by way of calculation, is 650 So your profit margin is reduced there. 
because your, your outgoings are going to be quite considerably higher. But if you get a good rate of 1.7, 1.79 or 2%, then your profit margin will increase because you'll pay the bank less for their money and your rent will be your rent because that will be dictated by area and size of property. So if the rent is 600 or 1,000 pounds in a particular area, that is what that market will dictate. So you can't say, oh, the bank is charging me 400 for this. I want to make 500 pounds. So therefore you are going to pay an extortionate amount of rent so I can make my profit. So you can't say that to a tenant. So what you need to do is you'll have to take the loss. So if, if your expenses are high because your mortgage payments are high, it will impact on your profit, line, on your profit margin. Is that okay. clear? Yes, that's correct. That's, uh, that answers me. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if anyone also has any other question. We're just going to move from this session now and move to the next session. So if you have any question, um, you're welcome to ask. We can attend to it uh, maybe after the session. But then uh, Cornelia just dropped her email address as well as her Instagram handle and the account in the uh, back channel. Please get it and uh, get to, you know, Talk to her and understand how um, you can connect and get into the networking of uh, real estate as well. And the masterclass that she's putting together uh, also alongside uh, Carol, I think they are really helpful. You really want to be there. You really want to be there. Thank you very much, Cornelia. It's been uh, such uh, a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Um, I must say once again, thank you, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome again. Now we're going to move to another session, another very, very, very interesting session. And uh, this session, the reason why I am actually looking forward to it is because it has to talk, it's had to do with um, some of the students, or rather the students in Africa and the institutions of learning in Africa. Um, he's uh, Mr. Ogochuku Obechie. Uh, he will actually be talking to us about the power of strategic collaboration among students and institutions of learning in Africa, and also the impact that it has in Africa's future. And that's what he'll be talking to us about. Um, Mr. Gachuku has been so kind enough to, like I said, he's in transit. So even before now, he had sent me um, a pre-recorded version of the conversation and has also um, said that he will be in the room to take questions and answers. So ladies and gentlemen, I will just play his presentation and then we can take question and answer when he comes in. Um, let me just quickly read a brief bio of Mr. Gotuku um, as I have it here with me. Um, I think, let me just do this. Okay. Sorry, okay. Let me just quickly make a brief bio of Mr. Ogochuku uh, before, before he comes on. So Mr. Ogochuku uh, Chidebere Umweke is an African from Nigeria. He loves to refer to himself as an African and a Pan-African. He's a lawyer, a social media consultant, a relationship consultant. He's a public speaker, a professional mediator, and an ADRO advocate. He's currently the vice president of Synergies Institute in Ghana. His knowledge about youth in Africa is current and comprehensive. As he has been lecturing and speaking in various universities and communities in, in various countries and in various capacities since 2001. Mr. Ogotuku's contribution to the use of social media in teaching and learning on and off campus won an award for the African University College of Communication, AUCC in New York and the United States of America through a program facilitated by the AUCC and Simmons College, Boston in the United States of America. He's also the associate director of with one of the associate directors with an international institute for ICT and journalism. Mr. Ogochuku has received training in various areas, such as relations and has, and has certificates in all these. Some of the areas are 
philosophy from the University of Edinburgh, entrepreneurship from the University of Maryland, creative problem solving from the University of Me Me Minnesota, religious literacy from Harvard University, contract law from Harvard University, environmental law from the University of North Carolina. He's all, he also serves as a part-time lecturer, a part-time lecturer at Regent University College and of uh, Science and Technology and King's University College, both in Accra, Ghana. As he presented radio and TV shows related to lifestyle and current affairs and its regular panelists on various TV and radio programs across West Africa. He served as a director and as a director of corporate affairs at the African University College of Communications from a little over, over a year after serving as director of student affairs in the same school for over four years. He is the president and the founder of the African Way, a youth focused organization whose aim is to rebuild the leadership of Africa. He's also the initiator and the host of Marriage Clinic, one of the most reputable relationship programs in Ghana, West Africa. He has also served as resource person in many trainings, both for both public and private sectors, addressing issues related to leadership, interpersonal and interpersonal and extrapersonal relationship, and basic workplace uh, realities with major focus on how they can affect productivity and profitability in businesses. Mr. Gochuku is very passionate about helping small and growing businesses, finding the relevance, finding their relevance by carving a niche for themselves through creative problem solving and creative problem pre prevention as this is the surest way to find relevance and profitability. He believes that the, that is an African perspective to everything under the sun. He believes that an idea is not worth pursuing if it is not solution-based. He is originally in, sorry, he's original in his delivery, both in style and in content. And he focuses on client needs in the development of thematic areas which make up his training. He's an inspirational speaker who's able to motivate the weak to become strong and aspire for greatness with faith and a wonderful future. Mr. Ogochuku is on LinkedIn. You can find him on Ogo, as Ogochuku Mweke and futures on www.relationshiphealthcenter.org. That's Mr. Ogochuku Chidebere. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to crave your indulgence that, and, I, and share my screen so that you will actually have this presentation now. Um, please give me a second as I do that. If you, can you see my screen though? Can you see my screen already? No, we can't see. We just see you. We don't see the information yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll share information now. Um, let me. I'm trying to create a space here and find what's going on. Let's just give me a second. I'm trying. I'm uh, trying to get my hands around it. I think I had it sorted earlier. Yeah. Why don't you take me to my desk? Yeah.
Um, uh, get more time. guys okay so your your controls might be a little bit different than ours at the bottom of your screen or do you see where it says share screen yeah i can see that and um from trying usually to... yeah usually if you if you click share screen it'll allow you to share screen with your audio okay so it's, all right now we can see your um we can, there we go we can see him all right. So the there you go. Thank you very much, William. You're welcome, sir. Hi, Prince, we can't hear anything. You can't hear anything? No, we can't hear anything. No. For how long? For, um, since it's been running. I yeah, don't think for, anybody for, else... about, for about some seconds now, we should not be hearing yeah. anything. We Thank can't you. hear anything, yeah. I'm sorry about that, I didn't know. Um... Let me just check the volume. Yeah, the volume is fine. Can you see my screen though? Um, oh, why can't you hear anything? I can hear him. So I don't know if I'm sharing my screen with you. Let's see. Okay, please, I'm gonna play it again and please let me know if you, oh, okay. I think I found it, please let me know if you get it now. Very warm greetings to you. Uh, my name is Ogot yeah, Kuchi. Yeah, thank, thank you. It's an absolute honor to be part of this conference today. Um, it's uh, it's just amazing that, you know, we, we are having this opportunity to converse one with another, you know, on the African continent and uh, how we can drive the African continent forward under the theme of um, transforming Africa through effective sector collaboration. I'd like to particularly thank the One Africa Forum team for putting this event together 
and uh, doing all it um, required to make sure that it's um, a success up to this point. And we are trusting that you know the the success of this event will not just be with regards to how the event was organized, but with regards to the fact that we are all you know inspired to think towards the progress of Africa through the collaboration that events like this have made available. Um, like, like I said, my name is Sobot I'm, I'm an African from Nigeria. I'm a lawyer. I'm an educator. I've been in the education sector for about 20 years now. <laughs> and um, there's, there's just so much, there's so much that we have experienced, especially on the African continent. Um, in the area of education, and I am I am just very privileged, you know, to be in this in this meeting to share a bit of experience with with you, as far as um, that collaboration, you know, is concerned among African students, especially in Africa. Now, when we speak of education in Africa, and I, I need to add at this point that I'm a Pan-Africanist, and so there are so many things that I, I look at from the African perspective. As a matter of fact, I, I don't see any other perspective outside the African perspective as far as providing solutions to African challenges are concerned. Um, we can learn from any other society, but when it comes to resolving our issues, if we're not able to apply the information that we receive even from other societies, you know, from the African perspective, we will never be able to use it to solve or, yeah, or resolve African challenges. So, so yes, my responsibility is to speak on the subject of collaboration from the area of education. And um, I'd, I'd like to start by saying that the, the African has gone through a lot of, you know, disadvantages as far as education is concerned. And some of the times when I speak on the subject of education and Africa, I never fail to mention the fact that what we have received so far is indoctrination and not education. Because education is supposed to empower you. Education is supposed to bring you face to face with, with your, your heritage, with the things that are supposed to make you proud and inspired to bring the value that is needed in your society. You know, whether it's in terms of preserving a legacy or starting a legacy that others would have the responsibility of preserving. And that has been one of the challenges of Africa. We, we, we are taught, even in our schools, you know, to, to learn and do things from the perspectives of other societies. You know, we look at Africa, even as Africans, we look at Africa from the lenses of other societies. And some of the times it's not the fault of the African, but it's, it's, it's a function of this indoctrination that we have experienced and how it has, you know, torn us apart and messed up our minds, you know, even to the point that in the classroom, we are able to still see, you know, Africa from, from the perspective of what Africa truly is and how we can use the information we receive about Africa to move Africa forward. So quite a number of times, and, and this, is, this is the experience that I've had, Quite a number of times, a lot of African you wonder, you know, what, what is there to be proud of when you speak of Africa? You know, why should we keep paying attention to issues related to slavery and colonization instead of just getting up and moving, you know, like every other society that may have experienced the things that we have experienced in the past? But our, our situation is a very peculiar one. And the, the experiences that we've had within this period are still continuing which is part of what you see in our classrooms. And that is the reason the African, the African professional, you know, after graduating from the African University, is unable to effectively contribute to the issues that are going on in Africa, to provide solutions to the challenges that Africa is going through. Because I always say that you can never use the solutions of other societies to solve Africa's problems. I'll give you an instance of what I mean. So you, you have, um, five people sitting down and discussing a particular subject, um, whether, whether it is uh, economics or health or anything that you want to talk about. Now, when you have a German, a Chinese, a Russian, a British, and an, Af and an African sitting together to discuss health 
or economics or the environment, whatever it is, the Chinese will speak from the Chinese perspective. The Russian will speak from a Russian perspective. The German will speak from a German perspective. The British will speak from a British perspective. But when the African is going to speak to the issue, they will speak either like a German, a Chinese, a British, or any other society where he's learned from. That is a fundamental challenge when it comes to African education. Now, the African is on a journey of rediscovery, and there's a lot of information that is being shared, you know, among us in, in so many ways. Now, East Africa is, is, is very endowed, and you know, when it comes to some of this information, there's, there's a lot that is going around, you know, in, in East Africa and Southern Africa, okay? But with West Africa, we, we are not very connected with some of the information that has to do with Africa and the experiences that we've had as Africans. And, you know, our history is not taken as seriously as it ought to, as it ought to be. And so, in the process, there is so much we do not know yet. It is our responsibility to make sure that we are able to discover ourselves and push the agenda even to the point where there is an overhauling of the education system in Africa. Okay, in whatever region that you're talking about, there is an overhauling of the education system so that we are able to truly appreciate education for what it's supposed to be, so that we are empowered to construct our society the way our society is meant to be. Learning the information and learning things from other societies, which give us the impression that we have nothing to be proud of as Africans, we have no heritage to be proud of, we have no legacy to preserve, we have you know, nothing to learn from you know, as far as our past was concerned. You know, it's something that we need to find a way to correct. That narrative has got to be corrected. I remember what um, Chino Achebe said, you know, some time ago when he was being interviewed. He said that he would be glad if his books, especially the ones that were set in the past, did no more than teach the African that his past was not one long night of savagery that the, that the white man acting on God's behalf delivered them from. Now, one of the things that I learned from that statement is that this guy and, and his generation and so many other people were pushing towards the agenda of educating the African to bring us to a point where we discover that there is so much to be proud of, so much to work on, so much to discover, so much to rediscover, so much to work with. And the truth of the matter is that we cannot do these things individually. The moment we get individualistic, we're not just going to be shut down, we're also not going to be able to achieve what we need to achieve. And it brings me, you know, to remembrance of what um, Kwame Nkrumah said at the point where the African, uh, the Organization of African um, Unity, which is now called the African Union, you know, was being inaugurated. He made it very, very clear that no African society or no African country will be able to stand on its own and achieve the things that are necessary for the 20th and 21st century. Whether you're talking about economic strength or, or security, you know, or, or any of those things, no African country is going to be able to achieve it on its own. And, and it reminds me as well, you know, of, of what he said on the, on the, on the, well, on, on the day that um, Ghana was reclaiming its freedom, where he said that the liberation of Ghana will be meaningless you know, if it doesn't bring about the total liberation of the entire African continent. And, and you know, when I hear what he said at the OAU and hear what he said at the um, Liberation Party of, of Ghana on the 6th of March, 1957, yes, uh, and, and I'm carefully avoiding to use the word independence, it's, 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 for, it's for another conversation. You know, so when, when I think about that, I think very seriously about collaboration. You know, how can we collaborate? We need to come to a point where we are sharing information. We need to have platforms, you know, platforms like this, but going beyond this platform, you know, because this is, you know, just a conference, but going beyond this platform into platforms where we can converse daily, where we can connect daily, especially using 
social media as effectively as we can, as a resource center, you know, as a resource platform where we can share information, information that we have now discovered about ourselves, whether it's in the area of spirituality, fashion, health, education, you know, some of the things that they didn't want us to know in the past that we are now getting to know, we cannot leave it to ourselves. We cannot use it to just enrich ourselves. We need to throw these things into the open so that the African from West Africa will be proud of the African from East Africa and vice versa. You know, because now we're sharing information that points us to the reality that our past was not one long night of savagery from which the white man acting on God's behalf delivered us. The question that one, of, one or two of you might be asking at this point is, does Africa actually have what it takes to transform this society if we're just looking inward, you know, from the African um, perspective? And I'll tell you this for a fact. Every society has what it takes to transform itself. Every society has what it takes to sustain itself. Every society has what it takes to construct the kind of life and reality that they want. Every society has the power to create a narrative that can push them you know, towards the, the progress and the advancement that they desire. And that is one thing that Africans need to begin to pay attention to. But for us to be able to realize that, we need to look back into our society to connect again with some of these realities so that we'll be able to first be proud of it and then say, if our ancestors could do it in the pre colonial African society, then we can do it as well. Okay, so when you, when you look into books like Africans in Science by Ivan Bansetima or, or The Came Before Columbus or books by Sheikh Diop, Chancellor Williams, you know, th there is so much about African technology, African health, African education, you know, African politics, democracy, you know, that we can all learn from and practice. Now, when we pick this information and adopt them again as part of our, as part of our society, one of the things that is going to happen is that we are all going to be inspired to begin to think as to how we can use those information to create the kind of Africa that the world has never seen before. It worked for the Americans, it worked for the British, it worked for the Chinese, it's still working for them, it worked for, for the Japanese, it's worked for every other society, it's working for the Indians. And so it can work for the Africans, but we need to first appreciate these things, have exchange, exchange programs, exchange connections, debate on some of the subjects that are not clear to us. We cannot be afraid of our history. We cannot be afraid of our history, we cannot be afraid of our spirituality. Because the moment we discover ourselves, there is no empowerment that is greater than that. And it's just going to keep driving us forward into the kind of people that we want to be. And then we will have a strong voice on the global table. We will stop, you know, the world will stop taking us for granted. And the Africa that we've dreamt of, the Africa that Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, Patrice Lumumba all dreamt of will be achieved. Thank you very much. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be standing by for the questions that you might have, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Wow, this was awesome, 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 absolutely awesome, Prince. You know, this is my passion, education. So, <laughs> thank you for allowing me to host this section. And please, is he on the platform now? I don't think he's. No, I don't think he's on the platform now. Hi, Prince, can you hear me? I can't hear you. I beg your pardon? Um, is he on the platform now, the guest speaker that just spoke? He said he'll be, he'll be, he'll be able to answer a few questions. I'm just, because I want to open the forum so that we can answer questions. Is he? Yes, you can uh, open the forum for questions. But like I said, he's not in the house right now. Okay. Um, me. Um, he should be here in about six, seven minutes. Okay. But then, I mean, um, okay. you actually have uh, a lot of passion, so much passion in this sector, in this uh, in this area of education, and you know, seeing how we can uh, you know transform it. In Africa. Um, I'd like you to champion this conversation before okay. the and uh, just tell us how we can, um, you know do this together, you know, okay. how do you, right. 
questions to him, which I would like you to um, to already start taking on this. Okay, how, thank you so much. How can institutions start partnering together, you know, uh, with, uh, with a futuristic mindset? How can they start partnering together? I mean, I wouldn't say there's so much competition among institutions, but there isn't uh, so much co collaboration either, you know, among institutions in Africa. How can they partner together, collaborate together, you know, to, to, uh, to transform Africa? What's your take on that, uh, Helen? I think um, I love for the, thank you so much, Prince. Um, I just love what um, the guest speaker just spoke about. It's for Africans to recognize who they are, to appreciate their culture. And once we recognize that, we are forced in by ourselves. We've adapted other people's cultures and we're teaching our children this. People are coming into Africa, especially, I'm speaking from Ghana perspective, um, respectively. And people are setting up schools and teaching a curriculum that is, um, you know, there's nobody governing it, as, uh, governing, it, governing it as so to speak. And we're yeah. teaching a culture that is not really ours. And I'm wondering when are we gonna start teaching our children, our generation about the culture that we actually have? Because in the UK, for example, the early years, which is my speciality, is teaching children about look outside play is effective. Yeah. In Africa, we've been playing outside for so many years. We were brought up from playing outside. This is something that we do not need to be taught. So in collaboration with like organizations, come on, we can have private organizations come together, you know, and, and put on programs, you know, and put on programs, um, leadership programs, for example, like this, um, network with other organizations will give children, give, for example, the youth, um, I have a doctor, Dr. Nat. I know she's not expecting me to introduce her, but if she's not busy, I'll ask her to just say something. She actually works for the University of Cape Coast. So she deals with a lot of youth. Okay, so if we have something whereby we can partner with the youth that are um, that doing university courses and we can have private um, people have their own businesses and offer any some uh, form of work experience, that is a start, you know, but I think we need to, we need to really, really scale back and take it back to early years and start from the foundation, those foundation years. And I mean, for me, I'm so passionate about what he said. I mean, it's all about going back to the roots, going back to our own culture and recognizing that as Africans in, in education. Because if you empower the youth, if you empower children about who they are, okay, we can affect every other society. Yes, because it starts from teaching, it starts from education, but it starts from us. You know, so we need to let go of the mindset that everything fantastic, everything wonderful is from the UK, it's from America. We have so much culture, we need to embrace that. You know, so, I mean, I could go on and on and on. So I'm gonna open the forum. And I just wanna ask if Dr. Nat is available to speak. Dr. Nat, you don't need to put your camera on if you, if you, if, um, if you don't want to, but if you're available to speak, can you just share a few words for me, please, Dr. Nat? If you're available. She might be busy. Thank you. Um, yes, Sister Ellen, thank you so much. I, in fact, I, I was engaged with something, so I didn't really pay close attention. Um, if you'd tell me what um, perhaps aspect you want me to share something on, I'm ready to do that. Forgive okay. me, I'm engaged in so many things. I'm actually in the office. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I'm doing too many things at a time. I was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My perspective is that um, in terms of education in um, Ghana, I'm mm -hmm. so passionate, but I feel that we need to go back to our culture, go back to our roots. You know, we need to teach children who we are, what we are, and we need to empower them that way. And I'm, and I'm also looking at university students as well. I'm connecting with private organization, offering things like work experience, empowering them that way in terms of leadership. So they are not, do not need to work for other people. But I, I, I'm saying we need to descale our education to mm. back to the formative years, empower children, because in UK, we're teaching children about playing outside. Well, we've been doing that for centuries. We're not teaching children about our own culture. So I just want to ask your perspective on that before I open the forum. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ellen. I think that you're, you're right on point. And um, it's interesting that even in the UK, you're introducing this to the people play. 
in Africa, we are supposed to encourage them to do that, but it looks like now they do more indoor stuff than even the outdoor play. And interestingly, I'm doing a work with one lady from primary education on play. In fact, we, we're connecting it to COVID time, how children are able to play um, when during the COVID time, and then now are they able to? So we are interviewing parents and then even the children themselves. And you're realizing that really most children are not even allowed prior to COVID. They are not allowed to go out and play. And so a lot of them do not know a lot of this are, um, what do you call it, ampe. A lot of children don't even know it. Um, what do you call it? There, there, there are other um, local games, hide and seek games, and so many others. In fact, I can't recall their local names, but my, my colleague, she's a typical local person, so she, she has the names. But yes, we realize that a lot of our children don't even know some of these games because they are not encouraged to play it. And then come to think of even those of you out there in the West introducing it. So in fact, it's going to be part of our recommendations that yes, children need to play. We all engaged in them. And you know, it has both the intellectual, the social and the emotional issues. I, I, I was with another group on a campaign where we were trying to talk about psychosocial support. And we realized that Introducing some of these games can even help solve some of the psychosocial issues because children need certain activities to, to be engaged in, to be able to, you know, feel belonged, feel loved, feel cared for and all that. And so, yes, I, I, I think that we would have to go deeper into this and see what we can do wherever we find ourselves, whatever recommendations we can give for the, the people in power, actually. If we have the influence, we can also push it. But we should also recommend that, yes, these are very, very important things. We should go back. Indeed, we have to go back to our roots and look at them and see what we can do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. And also about the, um, the university student in terms of partnership, because Prince was asking about partnership with private organization mm -hmm. offering. And I was saying that the youth at university and colleges, um, getting them some form of um, work experience with private organizations. Um, how do you feel that would, how do you feel about that concept? Yeah, that, that's also a brilliant idea. And I think um, some, some institutions are actually introducing some things. I don't know about this man who spoke, but there's another group called the Youth um, Synergy Fellowship or so. In fact, I'm a mentor for some of their students. They, okay. they come and then, yes, I, I take them to leadership and other forms of mentoring. So some, some groups actually are doing that. And then I, I, I'm also a, a mentor for, there's this other group they call the Yale group. I, I think it's not the Yale in the USA, but it's from the US though. There's another group like that. They all are also introduced. So for the Yale group, they are introduced to this um internship programs so they, they are giving letters to go out there and then wherever they fit or wherever they think that they can do something they are giving letters to go and then they do some internship there to get the work experience and all that yeah so some some institutions have come up and are doing but in fact they are just few i i know they are very few so i don't know what global can also do i think we can we can also start doing something that will help mentor those young ones, give them letters to also go out there and do some of this internship like the Yale group and then the Synergy group are doing. Yeah. Thank so, you yes. so much. Thank you for that and then, oh, let me just, so, sorry, let me just yeah. add this as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the faculties in the universities are also um, part of some of this thing. They give letters out to students when they're going on the long vacations so that they can, be part of industrial or whatever internship they're interested in. So the university actually does that. I know my faculty does that. And I know some other faculties in the University of Cape Coast are also doing that. So they help the, the students get some kind of um, work experience when they are on the very long back. Yeah, thank you. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Prince, I hope that answers your question. Well, yeah, yeah, it does answer my question. And um, 
and more, more than just answering my question, and which is always something I, 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 I try to do, and that's actually one of the reasons why we are having this conversation, is to, you know, to forge a way forward. I mean, she did ask a question, she, maybe we're doing something like that and so on. Yeah, we are building some partnerships that will start that training. And we are also uh, in the process of actually also launching a, another project as well that will start housing these uh, youngsters to train them as well, you know, to train them and, you know, build a camp for them that, uh, that can really, 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 really uh, enhance them and make them become real leaders and true leaders, you know? Um, I don't know how well to explain that, but that's just what we are envisaging. And yes, uh, of course, partnership is welcome. Collaboration is welcome. Whoever wants to come on board, let's sit and talk and brainstorm and also be able to map out these ideas and see how we can, you know, work on this and take on it and yeah, get the best out of it. So yes, thank you. I'm just um, gonna mute my mic now. I see that um, the speaker has joined us. Yes. I can see, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. But to you. Oku Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Oku uh, it's fine. I've got you cool. I've got you cool today, very much. Thank you so everyone. much. That was an excellent presentation. I share your passion so much. I'm into education. When I was just saying before you joined that we need to go back to basics, we need to descale. We need to, you know, we've taken on other people's culture and we've just let go of our own. And the syllabus that we that we have from the UK, I mean, even working with, you know, the government, we have to look at the policies. The most of the policies that you're using in education is from, you know, UK. And I'm saying, look, it's not even working in the UK. Why are you taking it? I mean, I specialize, <laughs> sorry, I'm, Harm I'm Helen from Harmony Education. Um, um, Harmony Education and... Um, I was introduced by to Prince on Clubhouse and we've been networking. So I was so passionate when I heard. So please, the platform is yours, please. We really, I loved your presentation. Anybody has any questions, please. The man himself is live and direct. Please share wow. your knowledge. <laughs> we also have Dr. Now the platform, although she's behind the scenes as well. She just shared um, a few nuggets with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Now. And please give us more of your wisdom, your knowledge. And we're so you know, honored to have you as one of our speakers. Thank you. Thank wow. you. Um, just, uh, just before you jump in, sir, I would, uh, I'd like you, you were not here when we played your, your, your uh, presentation. So I'd like you to just jump into uh, the question. We've, we've heard your presentation of uh, how do you think we can make strategic moves in order to start enhancing this collaboration? Okay, um, so very warm greetings to all of you once again. Thank you for this great opportunity. I, I truly appreciate it. Um, just before I, I answer that question, I, I, I'd just like to continue from where, you know, um, Helen, Helen stopped. There's just something very profound that she said, and I, I'd like to take it off from there, then bring in the issue of the collaboration. The, the, the subject of education is so important. Is so important because it, it creates the narrative, it creates the standards, and and you know how people are guided. I don't know if if any of you um, have been following, but even in the United States right now, the the quality of education and the pattern that is being given to the children is bringing them to a point where they are being convinced that slavery never happened. It started in Texas. The books have been published. The books are in the hands of, of, of children as we speak. And, and the impression it is given is that slavery never happened, that the, that the Africans that you, you, you find in the U.S. Were, were many immigrants and people that came to work. Now, imagine what's that, what, what's that, uh, what that is going to do in another 20 or 30 years. You're going to have a generation of people who who you know, stick out their neck and continue to debate on the issue of whether or not slavery happened and whether or not uh, Africans were carried away as slaves to the United States and to other parts of the world. That's how powerful education is. And with profound respect to, to all the people here that um, are of one religion or another, education has also uh, been the basis of 
how we see ourselves even in the African society. Okay, um, so you you have you have the you have the Christians and you have the Muslims that that answer other people's names without understanding the implication of such names, even on their own culture. The fact that you are disconnected from where you're coming from, from who you are. Okay, and so they tell you Peter is a Christian name, John is a Christian name, James is a Christian name. Well, they are not Christian names; they are Arabic names or they are, they are Jewish names. Okay, and then you say Mustafa is 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 a is a Muslim name, uh, Fatai is a Muslim name. No, they are they are Arabic names, and and we need to we need to understand some of these basics so that we will even see the value and and the reason we need to think about educating ourselves from the African perspective, because it's going to empower us, it's going to make us proud of ourselves, give us a place on the global table. And when we speak of the collaboration, there's just, well, there, there are so many opportunities that we have right now. A meeting like this is, is one of them, you know, where we have the opportunity to, to share thoughts. I'm already seeing an, another educator in, in the person of Helen, you know, I mean, just my first encounter, you know, and, and it gives us the opportunity to just keep sharing information. The interesting thing is that there is, there is none of us here that, that, that knows everything he or she should know about Africa. And so the, the first thing that happens is that we, we compare notes and, and we, get to, we get to build the right resource that we're going to share to the, to the public and to the rest of the world about what Africa or who Africans truly are. Okay, so we, we pick up we pick up the information like uh, Helena Pia is, is Ghanaian and so you know about the Confanoche, yeah, Santua, you know, and all that. Now when you speak of a Confanoche, the first impression a Christian will give to you is that that's a cultic, that's a fetish priest, that's an evil man. Okay. But but they they, they want you to appreciate their own culture, their you know, their own way of life and all of that. In Ghana, for instance, the 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 marriage of the Ghanaian is called engagement. And, and it, it continues to be engagement until you wed in church. That's, that's, that, that, that's how bad it is. And it's all a function of the indoctrination that we're talking about. And so, but when we begin to receive information on a platform like this, I can talk about the engagement and Helen will correct me to say, no, that is actually marriage you know, in the Ghanaian society. It's not engagement, that is the marriage that we're talking about education flows. And, and in the process, we also understand some of the basic things that will help us drive society. One of the challenges when it comes to the collaboration is that, you see, we're all victims of um, the indoctrination that, that we keep talking about, the way we think, the way we approach things, you know, the, the way we view Africa. Now, you look at, you look at politics in Africa, and, and the democracy that we are being taught. That, that is not African democracy, but Africa had its own democracy, you know, which we can learn and use to drive governance in our society. Okay, when, when it comes to um, the economy and, and working together, the administration that is supposed to be used to drive society. Now, we, we are a communal society. Okay, we believe in Ubuntu, we before me, we need to work together, we need to grow together, we need to share whatever it is that we have as, as a, a common entity. But right now, the, the standards that we're using to, to run the African society are standards of capitalism, okay, and, and the capitalism continues to make the poor poorer and the rich richer, and we have this... Um, this false false impression that we've created which we call the middle class okay and so people people contribute to to things watch their kinsmen steal from them but will not do anything about it okay so your kinsman steals from you collects all the monies and all the wealth that is meant to be shared in common makes it the grounds upon which he he um makes his life a better life, raises his children, you know, makes them wonderful people, and then invites you to his daughter's wedding, gives you, gives you a piece of chicken, you know, and, and what you don't realize is that what you're actually eating is your money, you know, but, but you're praising the person and you're saying, oh, the wedding was great. But if we can go back to the communal, communal way of life, 
we will be able to train ourselves on how we can live communally. The question is, is it, is it possible at this point with all the things that we have experienced? Well, China did it. China did it. China refused to throw away the, the, the concept of peace and famine. You know, in 1977, when the World Bank and IMF were telling them that, yes, it might be good, so, you know, but it is not economically viable. The intention was to throw it away and apply whatever new technology and new theories that were coming from the West. But they refused to do that. And, and today, it's not just technology, you know, that, that has sustained China, but those peasant farmers, those, those, those um, people that are into sustainable agriculture and all that, those are the people, or subsistence ag agriculture, sorry. You know, those are the people that have added a lot of value to the Chinese society and kept them going. But in our case, we just keep throwing things away. So we need to come back to the table. When it comes to technology, first, in the area of technology and inventions, we even need to come to a point where we appreciate the fact that, hey, most of the things that we're giving credit to, the, to Europe and the West for actually came out of Africa. And if we can learn that, we, we go back to the drawing board and we're saying to ourselves, how do we improve on where our ancestors stopped? How do we make it better? How do we, how do we um, enhance you know, the quality of lives that we are meant to live based on the technologies that our ancestors you know, um, produced? Now, even, I don't know if there's anybody here that is a medical doctor, but, but uh, on the day that you're being inducted as a medical doctor, you're meant to take the Hippocrates oath. And, and we are made to understand that Hippocrates is the founder and the father of medicine. Now, this was a guy that lived over 1,000 years after Imhotep was on the soil. Meaning that Hippocrates is not supposed to be the father of medicine. But our notes, our information, they were all destroyed to the point that we cannot even identify ourselves on the global table. We need to start sharing information. We need to start talking. And, you know, I'm just so thankful for social media. The fact that I don't have to come to Kenya to learn these things. We can just meet like this more often. We can just sit together, have a, a WhatsApp platform, have a Telegram platform, and just keep sharing information. Okay, information that is exciting. We don't have to agree with everything, but we are at least given the opportunity to think critically about the, the information. And the ones that we find out are not true, we discard of them, but we will be able to grow a certain mentality. When we begin to grow, I mean, um, we're, we're 23 here or 22 now. Imagine, imagine if we're able to influence another 22 and another 22 and another 22. In another five months, we just might begin to run into people that are policymakers. And before you know it, the education system in Africa is going to be overhauled. Whatever it is that we are learning right now in the name of education is not education. It's not education. Thank you. you know, it, so we, we need to be able to we need to be able to get it right, know who we truly are, you know, connect with the realities of our ancestors. We, we, we can't we can't grow Africa without our own content. We can't. And everything that we have right now is just the narrative of another society. We are looking at, at ourselves through the lenses of the Berlin Conference of 1878. We're looking at ourselves through the lenses of of the definition of development that happened in the 1940s when Harry Truman spoke about it at the United Nations. We were not in any of these places. We didn't decide you know, to, to be part of any system that is running right now. We are just dragged into it and we are being told that our way of life is backwards, savage, evil, and all the other things that were being used to describe us. We need to come to a point where we correct these things. And the way to do it is platforms like this share information, bring out stuff, let us scrutinize it and say, oh, yes, this is true. It might not be so wonderful, but this is true. This is truly about us. What can we do to correct it? And out of it, we'll begin to build curricula, curricula that will, will, will be used in various parts of Africa, you know, that will teach us who, you know, who we are, what we are meant to do, and how we can drive our society forward from the African perspective. I think I should stop for now. <laughs> and just uh, that was amazing. Yes, ma'am. 
That was amazing. Um, I think, Pr Prince, does that answer your question? Oh, yes, it did. And um, yeah, it did. If there are anything, I think there's a way for So we can't hear you properly, friends. Can, can you hear me now? Your voice is really, really low. Why would that be? That's, that's better. We can hear you now. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. So thank you. I'm saying, yeah, I, it did answer my question. Thank you very much. It did answer the question. Um, so I'm just going to leave it back to you, Helen. Uh, but um, my next point would be, uh, what's the way forward? You know, <laughs> what's the way forward? Um, how do we get um, universities or institutions of learning? Uh, you're in Ghana, sir, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes, I am. In, uh, in, in, in Nairobi or whatever, whatever, you know, to partner on a project together on research. You know, we keep talking about the fact that we are not in what we are experiencing is not education or whatever we have to describe. But how do we, how do we have a research that can help us, you know? Uh, sorry, let me, yeah. Fine. How do we then get these, you know, institutions? You know, how do we encourage them to partner? You know, to work on sorry, this. To sorry to come in, please. I hardly hear you, and then I'm interpreting in sign language. I hardly hear what he's saying. Please, thank you. All right, thank you. Can you hear me now, sir? Yes, yes, it's okay by now. It's okay. Thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, my question, I'm just gonna go straight to it now. How do we get institutions of learning? You know to engage and embark in researches, you know, that can help us build a portfolio and maybe ultimately a new curriculum, you know, that actually, that we can eventually all say is no longer borrowed. But we keep saying we are having a borrowed education, having a borrowed education, but we still want to get our master's degrees, our PhD, and, you know, all on borrowed education, you understand? And so I am not a fan of you know, of uh, looking, for, always talking about the problem. And I, in your bio, I also saw it. If uh, if a prop, if an idea is not solution based, you know, I read it out. Then it shouldn't be counted as an idea. And that is it. So of all these, what is the solution? How do I? How do we get Ghana to to you know partner with, with Namibia? You know, to partner with Malawi or whatnot, research based in order to have a proper curricula that can uh, really, really, really. Um, talk and educate Africans. You know, we are not looking for a narrow-minded education, right? It needs to be expanded, it needs to be wide and broad and open, but we need an African kind of education. How do we achieve that, sir? Okay, so um, thank you very much. That's also a very, very um, important question. So it, it's already going on. It's already going on. It, it might not be happening on a large scale because you see, um, whatever it is that, that is running right now, is enforced through regulators. And, and some of the times you can't just get up and, and walk away from the regulators because if, if that even happens, you lose your license, you know, or, or whatever accreditation that you're running with. So one of the things that we've been able to do in Ghana, for instance, and I believe that um, Helen might also know, is that Africana studies is now being projected and taken very seriously in, in so many universities in, in Ghana. I'm the vice president of Synergies Institute of Ghana. It's one of the private universities here in Ghana. And uh, we are pushing the agenda for Africana studies and we are collaborating with a few other um, universities here. We're holding the, the seminars that will bring, you know, give some kind of popularity and reputation to some of the issues that we're discussing. And then individually, we also take up certain subjects and just write about them and have other people write in to say, I disagree with this. Maybe you should look at this from another perspective. And they are not just coming from, from the, the African continent. There are so many other Africans that are outside Africa that read these things and continue to make comments. For instance, one of the things that, that we are working on right now is um, how to deal with abuse and disrespect in, in African marriages. You know, and, and it's a series that's been running for over, over two months now. And the, the feedback has been wonderful. And out of it, a book is going to be um, published by the end of September, you know, to, to discuss the matter or to put it out there, you know, in terms of how marriage should be contracted in Africa and how some of those standards can help to check or ameliorate 
the issues of abuse and disrespect in African marriages. Um, we have the African University College of Communications. I was privileged to be director of um, student affairs in that school for about five years and then later became the director of corporate communications. And, and the, the partnership with them has even gone far beyond the African continent. But, you know, there, there's, um, there's partnership with a university in Uganda, in Kenya, in, um, in the United States, Morehouse College, I, I, I think it is. And so we have all these opportunities going on. But the other thing in terms of the way forward is, is for us first to stop being afraid of expressing ourselves in terms of the information that we get and the information we find. Some of the times we are afraid to share this information because someone somewhere is just gonna, is gonna say, um, where's your proof? You know, where's your proof? How did you, know, how did you get what you're saying? And if there, is, if there is no proof of what you're saying, then it will not be recognized. It will not be respected, okay? Um, people like Ivan Van Satima went through this until he came up with, you know, with his book and, and all of that. In fact, so many other professors from other parts of the world shut him down. We need to be able to, to appreciate the African standard. And one of the things that we have working against us is the fact that most of our contents, you know, were destroyed. Some of them were hidden and were stolen first and then hidden in the West. And they are not willing to release any of these things. And so if you're here and you're into politics, I think it is time for our political class or political leaders to also begin to provide service to the African by insisting that whatever information, whatever African content that is still hidden in the, in the museums and in the in the caves or wherever it is they put it in Europe should be sent back to us because these things contain the information that we seek. And then when we speak to ourselves, you know, in terms of the collaboration, I'm definitely going to be collaborating with Helen. I mean, there's, 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 there's no two ways about it. You know, I'm you have no choice. Out. You have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we're going to start, we're going to start talking and you never know from there, we can develop a small module, just a model for now. And we can use it to teach students in Synergies Institute, Ghana, for instance. And we do that, we give it publicity. Another school tries it, and another school tries it, and another school tries it. Before you know it, it might just become a point of reference. And that is how we develop. The societies that we are representing today and we are wishing to be like, that is how they, de they, they developed whatever it is they have today. Of course, after destroying what we have and making it look like we never had anything, okay? But we now have a platform that we can start with. The fact that we have discovered the truth, then we start projecting it, start running with it, okay? So Helen and I, another person, Prince comes on board, Arthur comes on board, and before you know it, we can even collaborate and write a book in any area, you know, of, of human existence as far as Africa is concerned. One book goes out there, you might just suddenly find other people saying, let's do another book. Let's make this a series. This is so interesting, but I don't think it's complete. There's more information that we need to share on this subject. We go back to the drawing board. And before you know it, in another one year, we might just have enough content for every aspect of social relations. And that is when even our university system and the education sector will begin to take us seriously in terms of content. That was awesome, absolutely awesome. Great, I'm, I'm, I'm sorted. I'm just waiting for action. Thank you. I just wanna open the forum. Um, this is so exciting to me. I'm so passionate about uh, um, this subject. As I said, education is my um, passion. I live and breathe it, you know, because wow. it should be accessible to every single body, every single person. And what, um, or just, sorry what the guest speaker is saying is like what i you know what i've been saying but it's like sometimes you feel like nobody's listening and the funny thing is is the west is adopting all the things from africa i mean like mixed classes that we have in africa the west is now adopting it now and i'm looking at it and saying to myself where are we going wrong as africans our traditions our wedding traditions as well so let me stop or else i could go on forever <laughs> i'm please oh, Please, Obochuku, please, can you put your details, how we can link up in the chat so that other people can also connect with you? 
you know, um, and it's a shame. He says the saying that um, if we want to put any anything in, in any knowledge, we put it. We have to put it in a book. And a lot of the times, as black people, um, we don't want to educate ourselves, you know. And for me, I'm doing my master's in education. You know, my passion, my my um, degree was in social sciences. So my passion has always been for things like this. You know. I have a hand up from Dr. Nass, so I'll hand over to Dr. Nass, but it's like all these, you know, social factors all come together. You know, you can't have one without the other, but inter they interconnect, you know, our wedding systems, as um, Obuchuku was saying. You know, we have our own tradition, but we've now adopted this white bridal gown thing, which is not our culture at all. We have our own culture. And again, we've just tossed it for something else. We have to come back to the basics. So please, Dr. Nye, you had your hand up. Would you like to say something? Yeah, thank you, um, um, Mr. Nweke. That, that was really powerful. Yes, that's awesome. You're doing great. And I just wanted to add, I think you've said it all. You've just nailed everything right there, just like that. And I was just enjoying and nodding over here. And I wanted to add that, yes, Africans should come together I think that the Association of Commonwealth Universities is doing very well by, you know, they bring us together. I was a fellow some time ago. Yeah, we went to Rwanda, African students. Yeah, and we were sharing our culture and doing so many other things. Yeah, but then I think that Africans themselves, like you're saying, we should also find a way of collaborating, coming into partnerships and signing MOUs so that we can help. We really have to pick the thing up. Otherwise our culture is fading. Our children do not know much about our culture and so much is getting lost. Sometimes I become so, so sad because yes, they took everything away from us. We had, we had a lot. We had, a, if, you, if you read, um, what do you call them? Those Nigerian actors, um, oh gosh. The name is not coming, but they, they actually wrote about what the, 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 the white man came to take from us. The African woman was a, a very powerful businesswoman. The African man lived very well with the African woman. You were talking about marriage and that's why I'm going this way again. The fact that, you know, when they came, we, we were more egalitarian than any other thing. We, we really respected and revered ourselves. And Ubuntu, indeed, is what we believed in because I am because you are. We did that. But then the, the black, the white man thought that no, the Victorian woman style was the best for us so that they can steal from us. And that is how come they took away everything that we valued. And you know, we also embraced it because of what they brought to us. We were so ignorant. And today the black man thinks that paying a bright price for a woman is buying hair. So then you have to brutalize hair. You have to, you know, do so many evil, be violent, you know, in, in the marriage and then do so many other things that are uncalled for. So in this, your research you're talking about, I think we have to disabuse the idea of bright price being purchasing the woman. It's just a token, a token that is given to the family for taking away the services of the woman. Because you cannot buy the woman. You can never buy the woman. The woman is serving her family and you're coming to take away that services, you know? And so you give a talking to the family and it is not like purchasing her. But this is what happens. A lot of the people we counsel say that, oh, but I bought her, I paid her bright price and I, I deserve better. I should do whatever I can do to her. And these are all challenges African women are facing nowadays, all because we have been marginalized. Colonization has taken over us so completely that I don't know, but we can, I think we can pick the bits and pieces. You were talking about collaboration. We can collaborate and do something good. We can write books that people will read and realize that no, there's something that needs to be done for the African to come back. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your presentation and then the responses. I'm grateful. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Now. That was that was very, very, very insightful. Thank you so much. Please, have we do we have any other questions that we would like to ask on education? So could you could um sorry, I guess speaker, 
has given us a blueprint on how we can actually implement this. You know, so he's not just talking about the problems, but he's coming up with a solution. So any contribution, anything that anybody else would like to add? Um, I would like to say something, if possible. Yes, of course, sorry. The floor is yours. Uh, my name is William, um, and I teach um, Web 2.0 and digital media here in the United States. Uh, my project is pro my projects are pro um, hands-on, um, academically based, and I always encourage my students when I'm teaching, and this is at the university level, that much of what we enjoy today um, came from Africa, the idea and concepts, and a lot of people don't really historically understand the key significance to African civilizations that way before Europeans, they were doing medical science. They were sailing the oceans. They were navigating by the stars. They were doing things that other nations in the world hadn't even thought of yet. So people, for the most part, need to be retaught that the cradle of civilization came from Africa. And even the technology that we have today, the foundation came from Africa because in their own way, they were using technology to perform surgeries, again, to navigate the oceans. And I would just like to see a, a platform where um, those in higher education and university level can come together and talk about changing the curriculum to empower the students to understand why the past is so influential and important to our future today. And I think that will open up a lot of young people's, you know, open up their eyes to see that they really need to go back and really study the true African history and the accomplish accomplishments that were made. So thank you for the opportunity. Can I add something to that as well, Helen? Yes, of course, please. The platform is open. Thank you so much, Mr. Jackson. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you, Connie. Please take the platform. I just enjoyed this speech. <laughs> I just <laughs> enjoyed it so much. If I could give you a high five, I would. <laughs> I come from one of those colonial families, you know, with the Zulus and the Irish, and they try to tell us this is the way it happened, but it's not. And I was one of those radical South Africans who said, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to read this write these history books and up till today we still have uh, laughs about it in our whatsapp groups you know it's like when you realize what fun we had and with our history books you know i said no this is no i'm, I'm i refuse to do that you know and yeah so um uh, talking about the diaspora families back here i love having these conversations i say to them guys why do you want to adapt a European identity? Why can't you just be a proud African? My daughter comes home and she has other African children. They were born in Europe, but they are still African. Both their parents are African. And they come back and say, I'm German. And I say, no, you can never be German. And we started doing groups here as well with women, teaching and telling them the importance to teach their children, accepting their identity. And you know, it, it all starts at home. If we don't teach and let our children know their identity, this is where the real problem starts when they go outside because they don't know who they are. They're confused on who they are. And these are conversations that's uncomfortable. I am, I love these conversations. They're always uncomfortable, but it's reality at the end of the day. We as mothers have such a big job to do and fathers as well, reserving our identity of our children. You know, I have a grandchild, she's German. Her mother tells us she's German. She comes to me and she says, Oma, but I'm not German. I'm half German, I'm half African, I'm African. If you see this child, see he's so African, she's got more African in her than you can ever imagine, yeah? But her mother tell her, no, 
this is not where you come from. And this is the thing that we are dealing with as diaspora as well, you know, the mothers teaching them, no, you're not African. And this is a serious problem that we need a solution for. And this is where I love when men are having these conversations as well, because, you know, um, we need we need these conversations. We need more of them, not just today in this conference for two days, but we need more of that because we do have a problem in this uh, angle where we talk about identity and um, our heritage. You know, our her be proud of your heritage. It doesn't matter where you come from. Be proud of your heritage. None of us are, can ask in which family or where we were born into but we should be proud of where we come from. Yeah, so this conversation we're gonna have, I'm gonna invite you to my room as well. Please do, I'm gonna bug you, please. This is a conversation about identity that we have to have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, that was excellent. We are about to round up, please. Is there any last, um, before, I any, any more questions before we I invite the last guest speaker to just round up for us? Is there any, anybody else like to make any contributions? Um, any comments? Let me just have a look okay. in the chat. Hello. Hi. Yeah, please, the sign language interpreter is here. Um, there's a deaf lady who just came to where I'm VM doing the video and then doing the interpreting. So she had the chance of um, listening to whatever we are saying right in front of me, behind okay. my laptop. And then um, he's very, she, sorry, she's very interested in the program. So she tried to log into the Facebook um, live, but it's rather unfortunate. He's telling me that um, my side, my, my portion is not being seen at Facebook um, live. So she is very bit worried. So I don't know if tomorrow's meeting we can make it in such a way that those outside can get to see of what we are doing. I mean, in the sign language interpretation. Okay, that will make sure that's done. Yeah, I think what we've done, we we just highlighted the guest speaker, so everybody knew who the guest speaker is. So we'll make that. We'll 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 change that for tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you for your great welcome. work. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm just going to hand over. Um. Oh, uh, sorry. Um. Doctor New New. Sorry. Oh. Uh, New. Oh, do, sorry, the last guest speaker, sorry. I just want to ask you in terms of special needs, and that's another passion of mine. And that is something that is really kind of like neglected. Um, if you can just touch on a, a little bit about special needs and where that's going in Africa. When you, when you say special needs, um, what, what, what do you mean, please? Okay, when I say special, I mean things like autism, because um, I had a situation where um, I, a family friend, a friend of mine, the daughter was born in London, went to UK, went to Ghana, and um, she then ended up coming back to the UK. And it was not noted that she had um, any learning difficulties or autism. She's now 34. She's now in the foster care system because obviously her family didn't know how to um, relate to her, didn't know what was wrong with her, you know, thought that was just bad behaviour. Um, I was thinking if it could have been picked up those that back in Ghana, something could have been done about it. And I know that special needs is an when I say special needs, I mean like autism, AHHD, um, this is what I mean. I mean, is there anything being done at the moment in terms of that? Now she's 34, she's in the foster care system, she's had two children now. And you know, in now what we're doing in the UK, we're diagnosing children as young as two you know, and making sure something actually happens. So that's a passion of mine. It's something I want to do in Africa. So just want to ask you, is there anything being done in terms of that in Africa, education? Yes. Yes, so um, the, 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 Ghana, the Ghana Health Service, you know, has taken up something like that, you know, um, but it, because it, quite a number of times, the other challenge we have in Africa is that the moment you bring up base, you're looking for funding, you know, you're, okay. you're, trying, to, you're trying to get someone that's going to fund if we can go back to the the standards that that we have known ourselves with okay we, we provide support systems for for everyone in that situation and what it what it does is is that it also 
helps us in educating them, in guiding them, in raising them, you know, building them um, with the kind of mentality and the confidence that they need, okay, yes, to, to also thrive in society. The only, the only challenge here is that it's an area that hasn't been very developed. Most of the people that are in it, as far as Ghana is concerned and Nigeria, they are non-governmental organizations and uh, they're not getting as much funding for perhaps as they're supposed to. But I think that it is also something that we can undertake, something that we, we can do. And the reason the funding is not coming is also because we've thrown away that communal dimension you know, of, our, of ourselves. Because you remember the African proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. That's you right. Know, we're, we're, all, we're all involved. And in, in, in Africa, we, we don't have disadvantaged children. You know, uh, maybe that's one of the reasons, you know, she, she returned with, with a lot of difficulty. We don't have disadvantaged children. We just have children, everyone growing together and all of that. But because of how things have been streamlined, we might not be able to give people the attention that they truly deserve. And so when we develop a curriculum in that regard, for instance, we also use it to train the caregivers, you know, because right now the University of Cape Coast is, is doing a program on special education. I think the University of Ghana as well, but um, University of Cape Coast, I am very certain about, okay? They are, they are doing trainings on special education. And so we have teachers right now, you know, that are able to provide um, care and teaching, okay, in the area of special education and special needs as, as, as you call them, you know, but we need to be able to, to grow it a little more and, and just believe that we can do these things. We don't need to do it you know, based on a curriculum that is um, from somewhere else. That is not to say we cannot learn from, from people, okay? But we, when we are doing it from our own perspective, we also pay attention to the peculiarities, you know, that, that come along with, with those things and, and we apply it properly. Currently, there are about two or three NGOs in Ghana that are attending to, to um, special needs. If, 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 let me borrow your, your words, okay? you know, special needs. And I think, I think it's, going, it's going quite well right now. I know a few of them that are even learning music and they're doing exceptionally well, you know, in that area. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, any more questions um, before I round up? Okay. Okay, can't see any more questions. Okay, I just want to thank you, take this opportunity um, on behalf of Prince I, and the team. Yes, okay. Oh, sorry, no, Dr. Nadia, you want to add something? You want to say yes, I, I just wanted something? to add to, yeah, what mm -hmm. he just said. I think GES also has few schools, though, that, that takes care of this uh, students or pupils with special needs. You know, um, we, we, we don't really see them as important. So a lot of families ignore them. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't pay attention to them. But then GES has few schools. And I think I, I remember um, hearing that they have schools in almost all the regions actually for, for the special people, students and uh, peoples with special needs. It's just that the teachers, like you said, yes, UCC has a program on special education. But then you realize that most of the students who take this program end up not going back, you know, to, to handle the situation. This, this actually needs a lot of attention and all that. But there are few of them. I, I must say that there are few teachers who are actually handling this uh, special uh, education, special uh, uh, peoples with special needs. Yeah. So, Auntie Ellen, if there's something you can do, you can, you can, Perhaps, and like like um, um, Mr. Nyeke said, it's about funding. Once they don't have enough funds, I know UNICEF and some other agencies sometimes support, but it's not much. It's it's not much to you know get a lot done for them. And so a lot of parents keep them at home and they, they deteriorate. I know the Jolu school, the Jolu special school. They they actually train them. And you know they are able to discover their potential, so they 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 train you in that line, and then when you complete, they take you back home and establish you. I I know that for sure. 
So, but, but then a lot of people don't know about these things, but if you send your child there, they train them, they are able to discover their potentials and then they train you in that line. And so when you're done, they send you back to your home or your community and they set you up with whatever business, whatever trade, whatever area you specialize in so that you can be stable. And so I, I know this is happening, but then yes, it needs funding, like I said, thank you. Thank you so much, Antona. Thank you. That is my passion. So um, I have one or two things up my sleeves, but I will share in due course. <laughs> okay. If there's no further questions, on behalf of Prince and the one. It's a minute, I'm, the... a minute, a minute, a minute, I beg. I'm okay. um, talking about um, the special needs. Um, the hearing pairs, that's, we use this name, deaf. They too can, um, are classified as um, um, special needs. And yes, then I've been right. in this system, I've been in sign language interpretation for 22 years now. Oh, wow. And then, uh, yes, this is what I've noticed. Um, those that go always go to the uh, um, pursue special education at Winneba, that's um, University of Education, and then um, that of um, um, UCC, some of the teachers end up staying at home. And then I can um, testify on one or two people here in Kofodia, um, Ghana here. We have those that have been trained, but they are not posting them to their um, relevant locations. I don't know if you are getting me. So they end up posting those that don't know anything about sign language to the school. So um, sometimes I take it upon myself to train those that have not gone through training to learn sign language interpretation. I have to take it upon myself to train them at Ufodia School for the Deaf. I sometimes go to um, Mampon School for the Deaf to train them. Meanwhile, we have those that have gone to um, Uniba to pursue special education as in um, sign language or any other special education programs. Meanwhile, they are being stayed at home and then they are not being posted at their locations. And then this is what I've done. In Kofoda Technical University, we have the deaf, the, the hearing impaired um, students here in ATU, Kofoda Technical University. And then I've been taking upon myself to interpret for them for the past, I think 2012, as at now. So we are doing our best, but the thing is that those that know the um, sign language are being um, not posted to their uh, specific locations, rather they are being stayed at home. And then those that don't know the sign language, they are being posted to uh, teach the um, deaf people. Meanwhile, you know the language barrier. So um, since we are here and then I'm their um, spokesperson as in sign language, anything you can, um, contact and then we can merge and then do things together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nuke, Nuke. So we have a representative, we have a representative in Ghana called um, Barbara. Barbara, um, um, Barbara, she is on the, um, she's on the Facebook platform because her Zoom is not working. So she's the representative in Ghana. So she'll be in touch. We'll link up with with her and also myself and others. So we'll yeah, I have, I have her number. I have her number too. So she, okay. uh, yes, she called me to join the group by interpreting in sign language. So okay. um, yes, yes, yes. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you for your great job. Thank you so much. So on that note, if we have no other further questions. I'd like to thank you on behalf of um, uh, uh, on behalf of um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Prince and the whole team. This has been so um, awesome, One Africa Forum. I just want to thank you so much for everybody for joining. We're here tomorrow at 11 a.m. That is UK time. And that's 12, um, 12 p.m. That is on, that is um, South African time as well. Um, so I just want to thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you, all the guest speakers. We are so privileged for your time. We do not take it for granted. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prince, for this great vision. Thank you, everybody that joined, that did now. I can't mention all the names. Um, uh, sorry, Mr. Jackson, William Jackson, we'll hear from you tomorrow. Thank you so much, Cornelia. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm, I'm so grateful, thank you. Thank you so much, Interpreter. Thank you so much as well. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. See bye, you all everybody, bye. 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 Prince, you just have to end the recording. Prince?
Prince, if you're, if you're there, um, could you just end the recording and I'll just um, shut the group down. Okay. Please just give me a second. Okay. Thank you, Prince. Okay, the room is closing. Thank you so much. See you all tomorrow.